just saying that it's true I'm not from the UK. I do import a lot of excellent scientists from the UK, including from the labs of, of many of the featured speakers in this particular event. So, <laughs> and actually have several Brazilian graduate students. My first PhD student is from Belo Horizonte, so I have a long history of research with um, research collaborations with very talented Brazilians. So what I want to talk about today is um, it's going to overlap to some extent with what's already been presented in terms of what cumulative culture is and uh, to a small extent whether this might be specific to human culture. But my core, I think, distinct area of expertise is cultural diversity and cross-cultural comparison. So one of the things that I want to talk about today is the um, kind of distinctive aspects of human culture as I see them, um, not just because human culture is characterized by its cumulative qualities and its complexity, but also by its diversity. So I'll be, be talking quite a bit about that in my lecture today. Can everyone hear me? Because it's odd, I can't. I can hear my own voice right here, but nothing more than that. So I will trust you. I see nods in the back, so that's excellent. Okay. So I think there's a widespread consensus that culture is not unique to humans, but humans are probably more cultural than any other animal. Uh, and one of the ways that I study human culture and its functionality and diversity is to do comparison. So I'm trained as a developmental psychologist and I study change over time in how children become members of the diverse populations that they're born into. I also do comparisons uh, between populations, within and between populations, which I'll, I'll talk a bit, um, well, quite extensively about today. And most recently, I started doing some dabbling when, in uh, comparative human and non-human primate comparisons um, to explore the kind of evolutionary basis for um, cumulative culture in more detail. Another thing that's distinctive about my research program is the use of mixed methods. So I do a lot of experiments and you'll learn about those today. I also do longitudinal study, ethnographic research, um, observational research, so a lot of the social learning research we're doing currently involves videotaping behavior and then coding it, often using software that was developed for um, observational research with non-human animals. So let's start with a question that's been visited already at this um, event. How does human cognition differ from other primates? Many ways, right? But one potential contender, I think a very um, strong contender, is social learning. So we have these large and complex brains, uh, and this is clearly part of uh, uh, our capacity to innovate, to use tools, to learn languages. We have very exciting and impressive brains. There's no, no two ways around that. But we also have very, uh, very voracious appetite for social information and learning from, um, from others that is clearly part of our capacity to acquire culture. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about social learning and the different ways that I study that. We have an extensive body of research documenting that humans are, human babies are psychologically prepared to learn from others. Young children, like those you see here and here and in several places around the room, this is nice. <laughs> um, these are children that I work with in our field site in Tana, Vanuatu, which is an island, part of a Melanesian archipelago. Ch young children like these are adept at learning the beliefs and behaviors, the languages, the practices of whatever population that they're born into. Um, and you're the capacity to acquire whatever cultural repertoire is locally relevant um, is really an extraordinary cognitive accomplishment. Requires enormous flexibility that we are, I think, probably alone among animals in possessing. So rather than view cultural diversity as something that is error or deviation or variation from a kind of core um, set of human universals, the fact that humans are capable of learning such diverse cultural repertoires, I think, is really at the core of what makes humans most interesting and unique. So you want to look at what makes humans special. I think our capacity to acquire um, such incredibly diverse toolkits with fundamentally the same brain is really worth um, systematic exploration. <clears throat> 
So our prolonged early development also sets us apart from not only other primates, but from um, lots of other animals. We're an altricial species, and our offspring are dependent upon us for, uh, for survival in, in a lot of industrialized um, environments around the world, in the West and in the East. The period of dependency of caregivers on caretakers has stretched to I don't know, three decades at least, 30 years, it's hard to know. Most of my students are still financially dependent upon their parents and families to some extent, and they're moving towards 30 years of age. So we're dependent on others for very long periods of time. And there's lots of reasons that to, to, to um, propose that this long juvenile period has lots of adaptive benefits. One of the things it allows us to do is to acquire all of these complex skills that human children need to acquire. It gives us this very prolonged period for social learning. So if you want to understand social learning as a kind of core, character, unique characteristic of our species, understanding how children engage in this to, to, to acquire cultural repertoires, I think is pretty critical. I put this picture up here to remind myself of how uneven human children, human infants are in what they can do. So, so this young man here, clearly struggling with the feeding himself, as you can see, um, bowel control, still not there yet. This is at least a year old and little guy's not there. Unfortunately for his parents not, and me when I visit. Um, but learned two languages with incredible efficiency in a short period of time. Um, learned grammar that as adults, if we try to learn the, the grammar of another language, would be much more effortful and let's face it, uh, much less accurate. <laughs> so, I mean, children are extraordinarily good at some things and in comparison to other other animals, like these two gorgeous beings here, say they got the bladder control and the feeding themselves down much faster than my nephew. Still no, you know, no spoken language, but you know, they can communicate their needs. We've already heard a bit about cumulative culture. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the way that I've studied our capacity for cumulative culture and the different uh, psychological aptitudes and capacities that we possess. In terms of the kind of core features of my research program, I'm interested in explaining culture in the following ways. Um, its complexity, its diversity, and how culture evolves, which is appropriate for a meeting like this. We know human minds are very complex cultural learning machines, if you want to use, or systems, I suppose. We could use a non-AI metaphor there. Human culture has evolved transmission systems. So not only is the human mind prepared to learn and construct culture, human cultures are prepared to transmit culture to members of that population. We have whole institutions called schools that are set up specifically to transmit information, right? So it really worked. This is a bi-directional process. Um, and the, the human toolkit of artifacts and technology are a really critical um, component of the cumulative cultural process. So imagine cumulative culture over the course of most of human history, which didn't have, up until fairly recently, didn't have literacy didn't have numeracy, didn't have systems for writing language down, didn't have um, laptops and computers for storing information, didn't have all of these ways to synthesize and store and track information that can be transmitted to future generations, which means, I mean, all of these cultural, tech, all this technology allows us to um, build upon the insights of pre previous generations in extremely efficient ways, right? And you think about how much of the complexity of human culture, or I should say human cognition, is stored in cultural artifacts. So we feel having all of these iPhones and smartphones and laptops and all of these cultural artifacts actually gives us the illusion we're much more smart, much more intelligent, know much more than we actually do, right? Spend a day without all your devices and try to navigate your physical space. 
We outsource a lot of this now to gadgets in ways that improve our efficiency. But culture makes us look smarter than we are in the absence of all of this technology. Um, and I, I bring this point up for several reasons. One is that most of the psychological research on cultural evolution and cumulative culture is, has been conducted in populations that are historically and globally pretty unrepresentative, certainly unrepresentative of, of human culture over the course of most of our history. So this is interesting in some respects, but it's worth noting that we live in artifact, technology-rich environments that really changes the game in terms of, of what we can store and transmit. Definition of culture here is group typical behavior. Social learning is a big part of that. I've mentioned that human culture is highly variable. Um, every when I spend time doing field work in Vanuatu, one of the things that I'm frequently reminded of is how, um, how incredibly inept I am at doing many very useful practical things, like building housing structures, like identifying ripe fruit, uh, like growing anything. I mean, how many of you in the room feel like you could, you could grow enough food to sustain yourself for the year? And you're living in, in a lush environment, by the way, so you already have a lot of advantages there. Any of you feel like you could self-sustain just based on the products of what you grow? I'll say that's a no. That's fine. I, I'm, I, I recently encountered a six-year-old who thought, who was very surprised to learn that chicken nuggets were made of chicken meat. Um, we're very disconnected from the natural environments that we work on. Um, and we're, we're, we're highly specialized in ways that make human populations more efficient and functional. But think about the consequences of this for individual level cognition. When we live in environments, or some of us live in environments, many of the people in the room, of course, probably all the people in the room, environments where we are directly reliant on others and other industries for all core tasks of life, right? What we eat, how we raise our children, um, you get the point. All of this is relevant to understanding cumulative culture from an evolutionary perspective, okay? So if social learning explains cultural transmission, um, which obviously it must, the underlying mechanisms gotta be universal to some extent. Children everywhere imitate. Every human population engages in teaching, despite claims from some cultural anthropologists. Um, all human populations teach, and the, kind, the, the ways in which they teach vary a lot, and I'll talk about that, but the core, the core repertoire um, is universal. I've never seen evidence to the contrary. Um, however, all of these different mechanisms of acquiring information need to be sufficiently plastic and flexible to accommodate you know, exceptionally variable toolkits. So you would expect both universality, but also high levels of flexibility. So the flexibility and diversity of cultural transmission and acquisition practices, the reason I study this is I think it provides insight into the evolution and the ontogeny of human cognition and culture. So one to, um, this is probably not a message that most of you in the room need to hear, but I, I feel obligated to, to mention this in every talk that I give. As I stated, the populations that are most widely studied within social science, I should say, um, are unrepresentative of human culture globally and historically. I just wanna bring this point home. So if we have time later, we can talk about all kinds of issues with the power dynamics within the scientific publishing industry and the dominance of English and how this excludes scholars who are non-English speaking, um, but we can get into that later. There's a lot of reasons for why we, we have this skew in, in our scholarship, but th these are data from the highest impact English language developmental science or developmental psychology journals. Um, and these are just very simple count of the population studied. So if you can see this here, uh, the US is pretty dominant, 50, almost 58% of the, pop, of the populations in the, in the papers studied are from the US. English speakers are friends from the UK. I think they're, they're a big part of that. Um, European, so we're, we're in terms of the, of, um, 
what's been labeled weird populations by Joe Henrich and his colleagues, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, fully 90% of the scholarship in these journals is from those populations. You look at where Brazil fits, tucked in there with all of South and Central America with less than 1%. Now, think about all the different ways this is problematic, but let's just talk about like overall population size. So not only are we studying populations that are unrepresentative along a number of different dimensions, we're also not studying the vast majority of the human population on the planet right now. This is part of what we are working on trying to correct. This is not a simple solution to this problem, but I think it's one that we should all be working towards. So how's culture transmitted? Teaching is a primary candidate. It's not the only way, but it's a, a pretty important way. Um, and as Christine mentioned in her lecture, I think we got, these are still off. <laughs> teaching teaching is, is incredibly interesting because it's the most sophisticated form of social learning and that of truly effective teaching requires that both the teacher and the learner take each other's perspective. And we've all been in situations where someone's been trying to teach us something clearly without taking into consideration what our prior knowledge is um, and either overestimating or underestimating what we know. Truly effective teaching is very psychologically and cognitively demanding and sophisticated. Uh, and and the, 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 the fact that humans are unique in this particular, I mean, way is worth unpacking. So we're unique in that we are motivated to take the perspective of others, including being very motivated to take the perspective of young organisms who are not very good at taking our perspective and don't seem very motivated to do that. It's also unique in that we spend a lot of our time and energy investing in information transfer in ways that is frankly costly to ourselves. So um, if you've ever spent time with, say, a three-year-old child doing a task, they almost certainly reduce the efficiency quite dramatically. Tried to bake, bake some cookies with a two or three-year-old. Right? They're going to take twice, three times as long to accomplish. Why do we do this? Because we're motivated to, to transmit information, especially if we've given, you know, we're the, the parents um, of the young child. But we're not just motivated to transmit information to our, you know, our kin, our biological offspring. I flew a very, very long distance just to transmit this information to you today. So um, there's a lot of, of psychological motivation to transmit information. Where did, teach, where did teaching come from? Why do we have it? Efficient information transfer. It means that you don't have to discover all the information yourself, although teaching, of course, varies in how efficient it is. One possibility is that teaching is a cultural adaptation. Um, that enables cultural transmission. Um, there's lots of debates within the psychological literature on whether pedagogy is natural, um, whether the kind of core components of teaching are um, uh, shared by all human populations. I think there's pretty good evidence that on some level, things like joint attention, perspective taking, that sort of thing are universal, but there's huge variation in how much um, populations teach and how they go about teaching. So I want to talk a little bit about research that I've done in Tana Vanuatu and the reason that we work in Tana, oh, there are a number of different reasons. One is that this population is um, due to the relative absence of mineral wealth on these islands. They were left relatively um, untouched by colonial powers. So the populations, at least up until relatively recently, um, were functioning kind of independently of the globalization and industrialization that's happening all over the world. That is no longer true. Every time I go back, there are more children in school, there are more people participating in the cash economy, um, and we're actually documenting these impacts. Um, the reason that we went there initially was to look at what is socialization, like what is child rearing and socialization and social learning, what do those look like in the absence of a formal educational system, which humans haven't had formal schools for most of our history. 
and, and also what are the impacts of market integration and lots of different aspects of what kind of globalized, industrialized economies currently look like on social learning. There is growing evidence that formal education has profound aspects on many different aspects of caretaking. These range from how parents direct their children's attention. So Barbara Rogoff and her colleagues, um, Suzanne Gaskins, and a, a number of others have done these very elegant studies documenting that when mothers, for example, when they go to school, the way that they parent their children changes. Right? So keep in mind, school is not just about learning content learning this fact and that fact and this information and that information, it is a fundamental reorganization of how you attend to others. So for example, the, 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 the layout of this room right now, the reason that it's not odd for me to stand up and go on and on and on for more than an hour and you all sit there in rapt attention, thank you for that. Um, this is a socialized, this is a, a kind of cultural convention that is a product of formal schooling. This feels very normal and natural to you if you've spent decades of your life in formal schools. So this attentional, this training of attention in a particular way has psychological consequences. Um, uh, so the, the, the ways in which um, parents direct their children's attention, the activities they encourage their children to, to engage in, there's a whole mountain of evidence that schooling changes socialization, right? And as I pointed out earlier on in my lecture, we are studying populations that are weird, right? That are, um, that are all, all the, the children that we're studying are almost without exception in schools. Their parents all went to school. Their grandparents probably went to school. So we're studying populations that have been through multiple generations of schooling. What we're not doing is documenting the impact of this historically recent engine of cultural socialization. And that's one of the things we're doing, um, we're attempting to do in, um, in our current research. So what we're working on currently is to document the impact of formal schooling on individual and community level outcomes. We're doing this by working in populations where schooling has been introduced relatively recently and populations vary internally in how much schooling ch children have received, their parents have received, um, as well as the quality of education, which as you know, varies enormously within populations perhaps except maybe Finland. I think they've kind of universally got high quality education worked out, but we know the Americans have not made the, yeah, not prioritized that yet. So populations vary not just in how much schooling they have access to, but the quality of the schooling. And all of this is relevant to learning, socialization, um, and social cognition. So I'm gonna give you one concrete example of ways in which teaching um, well, in, in this particular study, this is a cross-cultural comparison between the U.S. and Vanuatu. Uh, one, I think the most interesting aspect of this study is that we found an enormous amount of similarities between the teaching style um, in populations where, one, we have middle class, largely Euro-American parents, highly educated, and in the other, um, highly formally educated, I should, um, I should clarify. The other population is um, Tani's mothers who haven't attended formal schools but have a very rich repertoire of locally relevant knowledge and expertise. And we did a kind of controlled comparison task. So it was a, this was a just a, these are geometric shapes and we gave them the task uh, to rearrange them to create these more complex objects. Uh, this was really set out as a collaboration task, and parents and their children in both populations were equally good at this task. So they were able to accomplish it. This isn't a task where we're looking at, at differences in, in whether, um, in learning per se. This is really how do you work together with your parent, or how does your parent work together with you? What kinds of teaching behaviors occur in the context of 
of a collaborative activity. So we looked at different collaboration styles. We looked at task division. We also looked at verbal teaching, documented verbal teaching behavior and nonverbal teaching behavior. So a couple interesting things we found. And um, before I get into the, the kind of differences between populations, I want to point out the similarities, which were substantial, which in some ways are probably not that surprising, but still I think interesting to point out given how different these populations are in terms of amount of formal education, among, among other things. Both populations use an extensive amount of pointing, so there's lots of, of nonverbal teaching related behaviors. Um, they're in, uh, in both populations, they're sensitive, the, the caregivers are sensitive to the amount of knowledge the child has and the child's age. So caregivers in both populations modify how they interact with their child um, for a kind of younger child versus an older child. They also provide, caregivers provide more teaching support when the tasks are more, when aspects of the task are more challenging, right? So we, so evidence in both populations of quite a bit of very sensitive, flexible teaching related behaviors. And keep in mind, this task wasn't set up as a teaching task. So this wasn't, the instructions were not teach your child how to do this. It was do this task with your child. So here's what we found in terms of, of differences. We found that US caregivers talk a lot, a lot. So about 12 utterances per minute, which is more speech than I'm producing right now. It's a lot of talk. Americans do talk a lot, the stereotypes are true. So they're producing a lot of language. Their, um, their children are also using more language than, for example, the children in Tana. Now keep in mind, None of this language, this, this amount of language is not required to accomplish this task. The parents and children in Vanuatu do this task just fine with a fraction of the amount of language. Right? So there's an enormous amount of language being produced. Parents are asking their children a lot of questions, including some rhetorical questions, lots of, of discussion of planning. Um, and and why, why, might there, why might there be a lot of planning-related discussion in a middle-class American parent-child dyad. It's a product of schooling. It's a big part of what you learn to do in school is plan and coordinate your behavior. Why are American parents asking their children so many questions? Why are they directing so much language? Right? Part of it could be instruction, but we, we actually find there's a similar amount of instructional talk in terms of the use of imperatives in both populations. So most of this is extra talk. And we did a lot of, of, um, of interviews with parents after the fact about the use of language in the US. And a big part of that is parents have secondary pedagogical goals, which are to build their children's vocabulary, right? So teaching is a product of larger cultural environments in which people inhabit, right? Teaching the, the, the teaching styles that you see in a particular task are related to that particular task but also reflect a larger kind of pedagogical landscape, which in the US involves building a child's vocabulary. Vanuatu caregivers use much more uh, touch, contact. They use an extensive amount of nonverbal teaching behaviors. The amount of the use of imperatives or particular instructions were used in kind of maximally efficient ways. So there, unlike the US, there wasn't a lot of this kind of filler speech that almost all the language produced was targeted for a particular action at a particular time. So in fact, the, the, the teaching behavior is very efficient um, and it's, it differs primarily in, in volume, largely in what I would think, what I think of as kind of non-functional language categories. Uh, and what's, I think, another interesting aspect of this study is that the children in Vanuatu interact in ways that are very parallel to what the parents do. So they also use a lot more physical touch, a lot more gesture. So you see parallels between the ways in which caregivers interact and their, their children. So if the parents are producing a lot more language, the children tend to as well. If the parents are doing a lot more nonverbal teaching, the children are doing a lot more nonverbal gesturing also. Um, Another interesting aspect of this study is we replicated a lot of the, the findings um, from uh, research done in Guatemala, for example, that 
in, in, in the US, there was almost no variation in the amount of education the mothers had. So it was not possible to look at within population educational effects. But in, in Vanuatu, the amount of education the mothers had did vary um, to some degree. And what we found is that Nivan mothers, or mothers from Vanuatu who had been to more school, used more Western style teaching practices. So they produced much more language. They asked their children far more questions. And on that note, just the, the idea that it's a normal thing, a normative thing, I should say, to ask people questions that you already know the answer to. Just spoiler alert, this is a very odd thing to do. Young children remind us of this, right? This is why it's always difficult when you ask children, um, when you ask children questions, there's a lot of issues with test demands, and it's like, I assume you already know this, so I don't know why you're asking me this, and you're asking me again, so maybe I should do something differently. There's a lot of kind of social uh, dynamics associated with things like questions. But I can assure you just asking questions just to ask, and also asking children who are on average, other than maybe about you know dinosaurs and things like that, far less knowledgeable. <laughs> um, one very useful thing about doing field work in Vanuatu is I'm reminded of how how much I took for granted about my own environment um, and how we raise children and all the bizarre things that we do. I mean, everything is, nothing is bizarre when, you're, when your group does it and everything is bizarre when another group does it. One of my favorite moments um, as a mentor, and this, this, this incident occurred um, in full hearing and view of my graduate students and postdocs at the time, it was our first trip to Vanuatu to do field work and we were working in a village and I was asking this young mother how much she spoke to her infants. Right? Kind of question about infant-directed speech. We know the amount of speech directed toward infants varies between populations. So I asked her about this, and she said, she basically looked at me with compassion and also a bit of concern and said, you know, you know they can't talk, right? <laughs> winning, 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 yeah. So what I want to do now is transition a bit to away from transmission to acquisition. And these things are not independent. They always operate, um, obviously, in interaction. Um, but there's an enormous amount of evidence that young children are very well prepared to be taught, to acquire information from others. And not just to be taught, but to proactively go out in the world and imitate the behavior of others, emulate the behavior of others, learn through observation. Young children have a rich toolkit, right? They can learn through instruction, through direct observation, through interaction, through imitation. They have a, yeah, they have a repertoire. And we know that they, um, they're attentive to social input um, and they learn via observation. In my brief foray into doing some research with chimpanzees, what I have most learned is how little they are, they care for us as humans and how, how uninterested they are in the sorts of things that human children are, are deeply motivated to, um, motivated to learn about. So the, the fact that young children are motivated to do things for you just to interact with you, right? They're interested in your face, they're interested in your eyes, they're interested in talking to you, they want to please you kind of inexplicably. We just take that for granted that that's a normal thing, that they should do what we ask them to. They're enormously socially motivated. You don't need to give them food rewards, although they like those too, as do puppies, as it turns out. Everyone likes snacks. Uh, but human children don't need snacks in order to be motivated to reproduce the behavior of others. Clearly, the capacity to imitate is important for acquiring social information. Um, just as teaching might be a cultural adaptation, um, imitation might also be a cultural adaptation cognitive adaptation, both, all of the above. I've spent quite a bit of time studying what I think is the most perplexing thing about human behavior. Although it's, it's as I've found in studying this for an extensive amount of time and reading the, the wonderful scholarship of others on the topic of things like imitation, it's bizarre in some ways, but it's also enormously functional. And I think part of our secret to, the secret to our cultural complexity um, as a species. 
So I've studied what I call ritual, which I study ritual as a, is basically just a subcategory of social convention. These are kind of normative behavioral scripts that are shared by a group. Um, it's impossible to navigate human behavior without knowing the local rituals of a population. So ritual often is, people associate that with a religious ceremony, which of course is an example of a ritual. I think of ritual as a much broader category of behavior. Um, and a lot of our motivation to engage in social conventions or rituals or to acquire them is affiliative. Right? So a big part of why this young child is imitating behavior in the context of a religious ceremony I doubt he has a lot of deep understanding of the spiritual symbolic meaning, although I'm sure he'll learn that. But his motivation to reproduce this behavior is socially motivated, um, at least certainly in part. So I've studied ritual because I think it provides insight into our motivation to um, engage in social learning. Um, and also, it really, if you've done any sort of traveling to other populations, it's immediately apparent that you need to learn the local conventions in order to have kind of effective social interactions. Um, we were talking about Japan earlier and um, our shared fondness of Jap Japanese culture. One of the things that struck me in a recent visit to Japan was the, um, the sheer number of times you need to change your footwear. Uh, upon entering a <laughs> home. Um, so there, uh, the inn that I was staying in required four different pairs of slippers. When you enter into the kind of common area, when you enter into your living quarters, there's special shoes for the kitchen and the food, food related areas, as well as the bathroom. Uh, I didn't bring slippers with me and I'm taller than most Japanese women. So let's say my feet are also larger. So the slippers that I wore on this trip were not really the right size. Interesting about this is that I wore them anyway. And, <laughs> and this, because this gave, these, these rituals and conventions, they give you a, a, a kind of an entry into a population and they allow you to participate in local behaviors. Interesting that I continued to wear these slippers even inside the room where no one would see if I changed my slippers, but I did anyway. Right? This is the power of, of social convention. It was so important to me to feel like I was, a, I was a member, I wore these very uncomfortable slippers. Okay. Another thing we've spent a lot of time studying in recent years are trade-offs between imitation and innovation. So human culture is, is and human psychology is characterized by high fidelity imitation, which we found is, is actually quite flexible. So young children can imitate behavior with very low fidelity, all the way um, to kind of high, very high, near perfect imitative fidelity. And young children adjust their imitative fidelity based on the goal of the task. Um, and one of the things we've been working on is how human children navigate the somewhat kind of competing demands of high fidelity imitation and behavior that is more innovative. Although I'm increasingly sure young children are, are not innovative really at all. We can talk about that later too. We've found in, in tasks where we've manipulated the, the stated goal of a task, that if you emphasize the instrumental, the, the kind of physical causal goal of a behavior, um, Young children over time imitate with much lower fidelity. If you emphasize the conventional um, objectives of a task, they imitate with much higher um, imitative fidelity. I was given an example of um, attending like a religious ceremony. No matter how many times you've participated in that ceremony, it's never appropriate to omit some of the causally irrelevant, perhaps unnecessary aspects of the ceremony. The whole point of a ritual and a convention is to imitate with high levels of fidelity. This signals group membership to others, this signals cooperative intent to others. There's lots of different functionality that high fidelity imitation has. It's not, it's very useful for acquiring information and for acquiring skills, absolutely. But it also signals to others that you are a competent member of a particular group. I think this is actually one of the reasons why people are so attentive 
to, um, and to, so sensitive to accent. So accent is something that if you haven't acquired a language at a young age, you almost always have accented speech, no matter how fluent you are in that language. So it's a cue to group membership that is very hard to fake. And deep, uh, complex knowledge of cultural conventions is also hard to fake, right? It's very hard to, um, hard to learn a lot of the kind of detailed complexities of, of rituals and cultural conventions if you aren't from that group or haven't spent a lot of time within that population. So we found in studies of five or six, or maybe seven populations now, we're working on 16 currently, but we've, we've studied this in at least seven populations. These are data from just the United States and, and Vanuatu. When you emphasize the instrumental nature of a task, children imitate with lower fidelity than if you emphasize the conventional aspect of a task. We find this in the US, we find this in Vanuatu, we found this everywhere we've conducted research to date. However, Overall imitative fidelity does vary between populations. There are also really fascinating individual differences in this, which we haven't documented very carefully, but are working on. Um, so if you find differences in something like imitative fidelity between populations, how do you explain the source of that variation? If the only information you have is just how they perform on one task, it's impossible to know what the source of that variation is. Keep in mind the US and Vanuatu differ in many, many, many ways. It's not just formal education, it's how many languages they speak, the particular languages, the economy, many different things. So we found this overall difference in imitative fidelity in Vanuatu versus the US, where in Vanuatu they imitate on average with higher fidelity. So we used a, a kind of converging evidence, a different paradigm, to look at how adults in that population, each population, evaluate high fidelity imitation. Right? So this is the paradigm that we used. In each population, we show an adult demonstrator. We use this, it's just a, it's a very simple necklace making task, which is designed to be accessible to children, where beads are strung on a necklace and there are a number of other peripheral actions that are part of this action sequence. So adults watch a video of an adult demonstrator and then they watch videos of two children from that population. One imit or reproduce, imitates the behavior perfectly, just exactly like the adult did. And the other imitates the behavior or reproduces the behavior, copies the behavior with much lower fidelity. Still makes a necklace, but it's not the same necklace, not the same behaviors. So there's a notable difference in conformity, uh, copying, high fidelity copying between the, um, the two children. Um, we did this, so we, this is, we used uh, multivocal ethnography. It's a very interesting paradigm that comes out of cognitive anthropology. So we looked at how adults evaluated their, um, the relative intelligence of these two children. So we just say, you, you know, you've seen these two children engage in this task. If you had to guess, which of these children do you think is most intelligent, right? And we've matched for all kinds of different model effects there and did the same thing within the US, and then we showed videos from the other group to each population, and here's what we found. So we find that in, the, in Vanuatu, there's a very strong bias to evaluate the high fidelity child as most intelligent in Vanuatu. We've now done this in five other populations. We find that everywhere, almost everywhere, um, although the outlier, the two outliers in our research thus far are the US and the UK. <laughs> And that there's a bias to, towards a, a low fidelity child as being more intelligent. So the US is very much an outlier in, in this. And we ask adults why they think the lower fidelity child or the child that reproduced the behavior with lower fidelity was more intelligent. What sorts of things do you think they said? What would an American parent say or an American adult? She's so creative, she's such an innovator. Right. She's a future leader. So just a little bit of behavioral variation there. Just that's the only, the only information they have is that this child imitated the behavior with lower fidelity than the other. American parents are attributing a lot to what is in fact just a tiny bit of behavioral variation. And note, behavioral variation is associated with innovation, which if you think about what innovation 
what the, the standards for innovation truly are, it's not just that you do something different, because you can do something different that's total garbage and useless, right? We do that all the time. Different is not enough. Um, it has to be something better, and it has to be something that other people take up and recognize and better as better and transmit to others. So what they're the, the, the participants are calling innovation here is just behavioral variation. Now, having all of those better, newer, or different, and better, and socially transmitted, that's a tall order for a young child. It's true. But my point here is that people differ tremendously in how they perceive or how they interpret what imitative fidelity means about the intelligence of a child. So there's huge variation in this. We found that this creativity, in this case, is really just behavioral variation, is associated with intelligence in the US. We found very strong socioeconomic effects of this. So we've now replicated the study in the US with, um, with adult participants who vary in the amount of education, their educational background, overall income, socioeconomic status. The higher, the more education you have, actually education is a stronger predictor of this than income. The more education you have, the more, in the US anyway, the more biased you are towards evaluating that low fidelity child as most intelligent. So there are variations, both dramatic variations between populations, but also within populations. So when I mentioned that we're studying the weird populations, we're typically studying middle class, upper middle class populations within weird populations, right? So we're not looking, we're not spending enough time looking at variation based on a variety of different demographic variables in, even in those populations that are most widely studied. Just a few words on what, there, what the other behavioral consequences of attributing more instrumental versus more conventional or ritual goals to behaviors. I've already mentioned the imitative differences in imitative fidelity. They're higher when children and adults um, in attribute the objective of a behavior to something conventional. We find the reverse for innovation. So especially over time, it makes sense if you're new to an activity, if you're a novice and you watch somebody engage in a behavior, it's perfectly reasonable and very efficient, in fact, to imitate every aspect of their behavior that you can, because you don't know what's necessary, what you can omit, what you can change, but that over time, once you understand the objective of the behavior and the mechanisms of, the, of the, the, the action or the action sequence, you can start to modify it, improve it, make it better, make it more efficient. And keep in mind, when I use the word innovation, these are studies with young children, typically. Um, and so we probably should use behavioral variation <laughs> um, rather than innovation, and as should most of the the field. I think there's, there's a lot of literature now that has documented um, pretty poor tool innovation in early childhood. And I think that's, we've replicated a lot of that per, um, relatively poor performance in our own studies. But I think that also these tasks can disguise the, the kind of subcomponents, the kind of ontogenetic foundations of innovation, which are developing um, over the course of, of that period. Because children are really good at generating behavioral variability. That's certainly relevant to innovation, even if they don't have the full, the full package. People are also much better at detecting differences when they attribute a behavior to, when they um, identify a behavior as a social convention, probably because they assume or expect higher levels of conformity for that behavior. We find this difference in imitative fidelity, not just with individual children, but also with parent-child interaction and with peers. So this is not just a function of individual level imitative fidelity. And we also find that functional fixedness is higher in the context of convention. So let's give an example of, of a lot of the, the artifacts associated with rituals like chalices and religious ceremonies could be used to hold water or hold liquid in other contexts, but people never use religious chalices outside of the context of the ceremony. Um, so a lot of artifacts used in conventions are used in very special, specific ways, and people are much more inflexible in how they use them. <laughs> 
So the point there is that there's a whole cascade of psychological and behavioral consequences associated with thinking about behavior instrumentally versus more ritualistically. So to, to wrap up my talk, I want to discuss a couple of things. One is how we're moving from documenting cultural variation and social learning capacities, for example, to trying to explain variation. Um, the first step in this is to gather far more information about populations that we, than we normally do in cross-cultural comparisons. So we're looking at documenting things like, or not looking, we're actively documenting ec things like ecological challenges, the degree of market integration, which is non-trivial in terms of, of how to compare market integration and what indicators of wealth are between populations. A lot of populations in the world don't have, um, don't work for wages. So comparing income in a direct way is a challenge. Social populations differ in terms of social organization, how hierarchical they are, for example, we're documenting that. Urbanization, of course. Kinship, I've talked a lot about formal education. Um, and also relative reliance on horizontal versus vertical transmission. Um, so this is one of the ways that we're attempting to kind of converge upon some explanatory information um, for cultural variation, rather than just saying, oh, they do it this way here, and they do it this way here, and who knows why. And when you have data from just one task, you can't explain that variation. We're working on a, um, quite a massive undertaking currently to document variation and continuity and similarities, those are just as interesting to me, in how we acquire and transmit culture. You notice we're working in Brazil here with Natalia, our Brazilian collaborator. We're working in 16 different populations that vary in a, a number of different ways. All those variables that I just described, um, as well as, as others. And you'll note we, we, have, we, also, we have several um, weird comparison populations in here. So we've got small scale societies, we have you know, subsistence agricultural populations, all the way up to places like Beijing. We're collecting data on you know, social learning tasks, as well as cognitive tasks. I think one of the, the um, major obstacles in the field of developmental psychology, it's, although it's not specific to developmental psychology, is this historical compartmentalization of cognitive versus social. This is a common thing in, in the field of psychology. Um, the problem with this is, of course, social and cognitive development are deeply interconnected and intertwined, and the actual human lived experience in mind doesn't um, operate within these different spheres. So in things like, things we study like imitative fidelity, it's a very cognitively demanding task. It takes a lot of attentional control, inhibitory control, working memory to observe the behavior of somebody else and reproduce it with high levels of fidelity. We need information about working memory and, and basic cognitive processes to try to understand the development of social learning. So we're working on, on that. Um, some of these tasks might look familiar. <laughs> these, are, um, these are not tying tasks that we're using to study teaching that are based on Christine's work. This is the... Um, the material that I showed earlier in the talk, this necklace making task, uh, which is just an imitative fidelity task. We've got a modified puzzle box. I think we got this from one of Claudio Tenney's papers. Um, and this is the uh, hook task, which has been used very <laughs> widely um, within the, um, uh, the developmental psychology literature. We also have several other innovation tasks that we're working with. So these are some of our social learning measures. We're also, we have a bunch of cognitive tasks. So we've got the, the marshmallow task, um, which has been linked to all kinds of academic outcomes later on. Um, spoiler alert, looks like there's massive cultural variation in this that is probably not linked to self-regulatory abilities, but much more associated with particular expectations for reciprocity. Um, more on that soon. We have a, a much more embodied self-regulation task, which is showing, by the way, far more cultural um, continuity or similarity between populations. Um, our biggest effects here are age differences, which you would predict. Um, we also have a number of, of working memory, inhibitory control measures um, as well. We've got measures of health, um, which are pretty important if you want to study things like the impact of formal schooling on cognitive and social outcomes 
some measure of health is, is pretty important. And we've also got lots of measures of getting extensive amount of demographic information from populations. And are also doing some pretty basic measures of um, academic achievement um, to look at uh, in many ways, this, these academic achievement measures are a proxy for the um, for schooling experience. Schools vary so much in quality. In many of the populations that we're working with, we have 12-year-olds um, who claim to have been in school for six or seven years and are not literate. So the amount, the quality of the education there is pretty low. The amount of time they're spending in school is pretty minimal. So we can't just use the amount of self-reported or the number of self-reported years of education to make to draw conclusions about what children are learning in those environments, which is why we are we included some basic academic achievement um, measures. Progress, there we go, moving forward. So we've got data collection complete in about two thirds of our sites. We're finishing up in, um, in well. We finished with Brazil most recently, or Natal, um, and data collection is ongoing in uh, Austin, which is it's actually far more difficult to collect data with a battery of measures like this in um, larger industrialized cities than in small-scale populations. Just simple things like access to the parents is quite an obstacle, but we're, we're up for the challenge. So stay tuned. We have quite quite a data set. We also are collecting extensive observational um, data in the schools, in the homes, um, in the villages, in population, in, in kind of contexts in which children spend a lot of their time. So a final word about cumulative culture. Uh, this makes us more, more appear more intelligent, more powerful um, from a cognitive perspective than we we would be if we were operating in the absence of these cultural artifacts, artifacts and technologies. Why do we have cumulative culture? Why is this part of cultural complexity? Um, it has massive functional benefits to um, all kinds of aspects of human functioning. Cumulative culture allows us to build upon the innovations of previous generations, which I, I mentioned before, and all of these artifacts that we have um, really facilitate and speed this up. It set our genus on an evolutionary pathway very distinct from all other species. Uh, another thing that I wanted to, to remind everybody of is, and it's hard to, to, I think, drive this point home forcefully enough, that the pace of technological and cultural change that is occurring at this point in our history as a species is totally unprecedented. I just think about the, the cultural technologies that you have access to now that compared to what you had access to 10 years ago. They're just dramatically different. Earlier this morning, I used my iPhone as a hot spot, internet hotspot to hook up my computer, you know, to connect with my laptop to send a presentation to project here, right, in a I've never been to before. <laughs> it's just the amount of change that is occurring is far more rapid than our cognitive or psychological capacity to adjust to this. Um, and this you know, explosive exponential growth and complexity in human culture is um, not something you see in non-human primates where you have relative stasis in complexity. Um, I wanted to mention that this ability to learn socially, as we've, I'm sure, heard about quite a bit today, um, is shared across many animal taxa. But cumulative culture, at least in terms of quantity and amount, is um, unique to humans. Innovation and cognitive flexibility, um, is studying that across hominin evolutionary history, is a big part of what we're working on currently. We're studying this between species, but we're also studying this across age and in different, um, different populations. So another critical way that populations vary currently, um, differences between human populations is just the amount of artifacts children interact with. A lot of the social learning tasks that we do with children involve artifacts, um, and these are in kind of triadic interaction tasks in a large portion of the world. Children are not living in environments full of material artifacts and man-made 
human-made objects. So just the, the presence of all of these physical manufactured things has impacts on um, social learning in our interactions with each other. I think the cultural inheritance of technologies allows, is what's allowed for this explosive growth in cultural complexity. I mean, keep in mind that this, the pace of, of cultural change and technological innovation has increased a lot in the past 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. Human brains have not changed a lot in the past one, two, 300 years. So we have, we need explanations for this exponential change that are not rooted in um, brain evolution. Um, obviously, that's not the explanation. And studying the psychology that enables the acquisition, transmission, and discovery of new information provides insight into cumulative culture, which is why we're studying it. We're looking at this horizontally um, within generations and vertically across generations. So all of the social learning tasks that we're doing, we're doing, looking at, at um, these tasks in the context of parent-child interaction, peer interaction, um, and in lots of other iterations between different um, social interactional partners. The last thing I wanted to say is that documenting variation in cultural acquisition and transmission is critical to understanding the evolution and ontogeny of cumulative culture and always keeping in mind that the population that we are currently the populations that we are, that many of us currently live in are unrepresentative of human populations globally and historically. This is, of course, directly relevant to the topics that we're studying, like cultural, um, cultural evolution, the use of technology, innovation, things of, of that sort. Um, taking this triadic approach of, or tripartite approach of doing comparisons um, across cultures, species, and age is not something that I do uniquely, but something I value a lot. And I know the other speakers in the um, in this workshop also do this for similar similar reasons. To thank my um, my funders, and um, most importantly, my many collaborators. Teamwork makes the dream work, as I say. Um, these are just a small portion of the people working on our cross-cultural um, international research currently. And I'll end there. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for your communication. Um, I would like to know if this kind of different context created by technology and also interactional innovations like formal education, if this can be interpreted as a niche construction that might enable um, adaptations that are not coded on DNA. I could not have said that better. I think I should that to, <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect characterization of, of what I think, what I think formal education is doing. So parenting, when I ask, when I ask students in my class what the goal of parenting is, they'll often say things like, to love your children. I'm like, no, 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 that's, yes, parents love their children, but that's not the goal of parenting. The goal of parenting is to equip children with the kinds of skills, um, conventional knowledge, linguistic abilities, interactional um, insight required to be a successful adult within the population that they're going to be operating within. So human, human cultures are um, this kind of niche construction thing. It's exactly what social learning and um, cultural transmission, all of that is tailored to the demands of unique particular contexts. So we, we're now living in, 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 in populations where you need to go to school, in many cases for decades, to acquire the highly specialized knowledge that you need. Uh, and we are training, we've set up cultural transmission systems like schools or institutions specifically to facilitate the very efficient transmission of enormous bodies of abstract <laughs> disembodied information. This 
is this makes us very well equipped to acquire particular types of skills, um, is less good at things like, you know, hands-on skill development, um, like acquiring kind of practical know-how, uh, trade-based knowledge. So there, there are these formal educational systems are very good at transmitting some types of knowledge and information, but relatively poor at transmitting others. And there's a trade-off associated with the perception of, you know, what people are going to need in order to be successful within a particular population. But we see all kinds of ways in which this is a, um, this can break down, and all kinds of ways in which are the institutions that we set up are almost always behind the times in terms of the speed of, of technological change. It's like things like patents. The, the amount of time it takes to get a patent approved is it's sufficiently long that new technologies will have already been developed <laughs> that, that basically negate the reason you even needed a patent to begin with. So the technologies or the, the institutions that we've set up are almost always preparing us for a recent past. And our university students know this. They tell us this all the time. So that they are, they're tailored to particular niches, but they, those niches move and change very rapidly and institutions can rarely keep pace, especially when the change is, is really rapid. Does it, in a small period of time, do you think this can, this can enable um, genetic changes? Very rarely. I can think of very few examples of that. There are some. There are some. But there are also, I think, there are. There would have to be an enormous amount of selective pressure. Please. Oh, sorry. There would have to be an enormous amount of selective pressure, um, and culture moves faster. Then genetic evolution could almost ever accommodate. There are some exceptions to that, right? And to uh, what age have you followed the two groups? How old were the children that you were following, and to which age? So we've worked there for about um, eight, nine years. So we have, we have data on the, the same children at, starting at about three or four when they first participated in, in our tasks and are following them over time. So those children are um, eight, nine, ten years older. Part of the reason that we're following them over time is because the Vanuatu, like most of the world, is globalizing and changing very, very rapidly. So more and more children are going to school. Historically, they didn't attend formal schools. Now they're attending schools. So we're tracking the impact of going to school on a variety of different outcomes, including things like social learning. Do you have the idea of following again more uh, through adolescence or something, or, or just stop that? Yeah, no, we, we have, so we're, we're following these children longitudinally. But we also have data from adolescents and adults okay. in all of these populations as well. Yeah. So, uh, we know that innovation and uh, fidelity are highly, well, not sure if highly, but they are influenced by uh, the demography of a population, right? In yeah. terms of population size and density. I, I wonder if studying, you know, like uh, groups from Texas and from Vanuatu, are you taking into account these, these factors? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's why we're, that's, why we're working in 16 different countries now to, to look at, to kind of isolate unique effects of population density, which, has a, which is highly correlated with, with um, urbanization. And I mean, this is, there, there are costs and, and benefits associated with doing 
um, both far cultural comparisons as well as close cultural comparisons, and we do the whole spectrum. So st studying you know, Vanuatu in a place like Texas, it's hard to imagine two populations more different. Right? But there's some questions where studying populations that differ in many ways, um, some questions are appropriate for that. So with that teaching task, despite enormous differences between these populations, in terms of the, the, the core kind of psychological infrastructure supporting teaching, it's very similar, despite huge differences. But from an explanatory perspective, if we only study those two, we'll never know the source of, that, of the variation. So, and, and in, in Vanuatu, there isn't an urban environment comparable to any major city in the industrialized world. So we have to do comparisons between, um, between other populations. So we're doing lots of, of, of um, so for example, doing comparisons within populations that vary in population density, urbanicity. These are highly correlated with access to schooling. So it does require extensive within and between population comparisons to isolate all of these different variables. So a combination of close and far cultural comparisons is the path forward. Hi, um, thank you for your amazing talk. Um, I'm just a grad student here at the university, but I'm also getting my teacher's license. So the topic of education is very sensitive to me. And here at the university, we learn to be how to be teachers based a lot on the constructivism. Yeah. So we learn to um, make make the children talk not only with the teacher or the caregiver, but also with each other. Um, so they have to make their, their own theories about how things happen and talk with each other and discuss it and afterwards they talk to the caregiver or the teacher and the concepts are then corrected in their minds. And I would like to know, it, it was a little bit groundbreaking to me to think that this uh, verbal factor of teaching could be overestimated by the um, constructivism, and I would like to know what is the important, the actual importance you would give, based on your data, to the verbal, the the verbal part of the process of teaching. Yeah. Well, the the way that you're the way that you're learning to teach is based on a particular you can call it an ethno psychology of information transmission. And this particular style of interaction, way of, of information acquisition, is, a very, is, is very carefully tailored to particular demographics that you're preparing students to enter. So these are um, the kinds of interactional styles that characterize you know, more highly educated, more Western populations, for example. Um, and if you're preparing students to enter into those kinds of populations and communities, then this is a perfectly reasonable way to do it. In the kinds of environments that we're in now, having very high levels of you know, verbal intelligence, being articulate, being able to communicate information effectively to people that you don't know, these are useful skills to have. Thus, the amount of speech that you are, are directing towards children and the amount of speech you're encouraging children to produce, are, it is preparing children for particular types of skills that will be useful to them, not just in school now, but in school going forward, in university. Um, I mean, one of the things that's, that's always amazing to me is how much people value the, um, when we you know, bring candidates in for a, a job interview, how much people value the presentation. I mean, some claim that they, get far, they put far more value on that than they probably should. But your ability to persuasively articulate a point of view, to use evidence, to communicate 
verbally in the kinds of environments that we're living in now, this is, this is tremendously useful. The extent to which this particular kind of ability, verbal ability, is required and, pr and valued does vary to some extent between populations. Although effective storytellers, narrators, people value these types of skills everywhere. They just spend a whole lot more time encouraging children to develop them in some populations than, than others. Um, but yeah, just the amount of variation between populations in how much parents talk to their children is pretty astonishing. We find parallel effects in um, the amount teachers speak to children as well. So the, the amount of child-directed speech and teacher, well, child-directed speech from the parent and the teacher in a population, extremely highly correlated. So even places where they, they're all, they all have formal schools, the local norms concerning expectations for speech vary. And, and the norms for what children are supposed to, how much speech they're supposed to direct towards adults. That varies too. Um, hi. So, uh, hi, Christine. Thanks for your talk. Um, this is something that I, I, we talked a little bit about before, but uh, my question is, um, do you think, so you said that you don't find uh, many differences in how the parents interact with their children like uh, verbally in those teaching uh, moments and collaborative moments, uh, but I wonder if, when, if we might maybe observe the opposite when we look at uh, families from uh, people from lower social classes in um, more Western and uh, richer countries, because when we compare um, more traditional societies and people from weird countries, they are usually, the parents and children are from middle class, upper middle class families, and we compare them with the traditional societies, but these uh, people are in completely different environments sometimes, and when we get families from uh, uh, lower social classes yeah. in these same weird, weird countries or in other countries, we might, maybe we may, we will observe that they, Perhaps they communicate less with their children, or uh, because if, if we think about people uh, subjected to very stressful conditions, yeah. and the way they interact might be different than uh, we expect, and instead uh, we m maybe we'll see that people from traditional societies and more weird are more similar than people from within the weird societies, but from different social classes. So, what do you think about that? I I think that's, that's an incredibly important and fascinating question. So a, a bunch of stuff going on there. One is that in, in both of these populations, in the populations that, at least that I presented here, parents spend quite a bit of time with their children. And if you spend quite a bit of time with your child or the more time you, you know, spend with anybody, you know them better, right? This Im impacts the kind of interactional style that you have. So that could be a kind of common denominator, uh, increasing similarities. I mean, the core differences between these populations are really in terms of the amount of speech. That we're, we're, we're finding that in both places they use imperatives, they're sensitive teachers. Now the issue of, of um, you know, potential effects of, of, of deprivation are, I've thought quite a bit about this. So in, in lower SES populations within the US, there is a, um, I mean, there's, there's often extensive amount of, of separation in terms of time between caregivers and their children. This is gonna impact how you, know, how you interact with your child, the way in which you interact with your child, the amount of energy that you have. Um, there, there are also differences in expectations for um, the role that a parent should be a teacher Right, so the, the expectation that, that parents are educators, this is the also variable. Um, and, and so that could be a small part of it. One of the things that we have documented that I think is relevant to this, in terms of the issue of the effects of amount of time, is that high SES parents 
especially those who are, you know, you, you have two parents working. There's an enormous amount of praise that occurs in the context of these interactions. You, you see almost none of that in Vanuatu, right? There's no overt, you're great, you're smart, this is great, you did great, this kind of thing. High income American parents do a lot of this. And I think one of the, I don't have any evidence for this, but one of my speculations <laughs> is that this kind of, of this, the use of praise is in many ways kind of a re like an affiliation behavior as a way to kind of reconnect with your child and reassure them of this connection. I love you, I'm close to you, I feel good about our relationship. And they're using a lot of verbal praise to deepen and try to deepen and strengthen that connection. A lot less of that is needed when you spend all of your time with your child. Right? If you're always around the kid and you're spending a lot of time, there's less of a need to remind the child through kind of a you know, verbal praise of the strength of that relationship. I don't think this is something that we've considered enough when we've studied things like praise. I think what we have found is that there is um, the, the, the more parents spend away from their children, more time they spend away from their children in highly educated populations, the more praise that occurs. Right? And this is this kind of affiliative function of this, this is one possibility. I'm not saying this is the only, only possibility. But I, I do think the amount of time you spend with your kid and the extent to which you know your child is gonna impact how you engage in a collaborative context. We, and we almost never document that. We almost never document how many hours per day do you spend with your child. Can you think of one developmental psych study where people have measured that? I don't think so. And that's a perfectly reasonable candidate for a lot of things, not just teaching, but a lot of different aspects of social cognition, interactional style. So to be continued on that, for sure. Can I ask you a question? Always. <laughs> well, it, uh, I guess it's a question. I'm just interested in, in your thoughts on what seems to me a bit of a kind of conundrum or puzzle about early child development to do with yeah. innovation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love your and uh, Mark Nielsen's characterization of uh, innovation and social learning as the twin engines of culture yeah. and particularly cumulative culture. Yes. Um, and you said at some point, you know, uh, but young children are really not very good at innovation. And I, and I agree with you, you know, yeah. if you look at research like, you know, giving them that test of they've got a pipe cleaner, yes. there's a little basket at the bottom of that cylinder, and you they don't think to make the hook. As soon as they see someone do it, then they, they've right. got it. Um, but if you watch children in, in free play, yeah. you know, whether they're playing with, with objects, um, or, or perhaps even more so in fantasy play, where they're you know, developing a whole narrative of you know, what's happening on this pirate ship or in this hospital or whatever. It seems to be just a, a string of amazing innovations. You know, they're very yes. inventive. So yeah. <clears throat> you see what I mean by the yeah. kind of paradox? Yeah. Um, why aren't they better at, at innovation, at the kind of innovation we might expect to drive cumulative culture, even in, in child groups? Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense as uh, a, uh, totally. a bit of a puzzle? I think that, that the, um, the bar for true innovation is very, very high, even for adults. Most adults don't produce innovations that are transmitted between generations. Um, that I, I do think young children are, are very skilled at all of the building blocks of innovation. So I think that they are, um, they probably generate more variability and their hypothesis space is their search space is probably wider than adults, um, which can have the benefit of coming up with, as Alison Gopnik and others have described, um, come up with kind of low base rate solutions that adults might miss because they're much more narrowly focused. So the behavioral var variability, which is a critical part of innovation is, you know, young children have in spades but the, the, the better part of it is a challenge because they don't have the, the, they almost never have the content knowledge that is, is required for most of our, you know, for most innovations. So a lot of our technological innovations require enormous mastery of complex insights um, in order to um, kind of build upon those. So I think we, we have to think, we, what I think we need to do as a field is come up with a more nuanced, kind of developmentally appropriate um, taxonomy 
of what innovation looks like. Because you're right, you, you, you give these children the, the hook task and they're not good at this, but they get much better at it in a fairly short amount of time. Um, and one of the things that we found that young children are great at is coming up with a great variety of different strategies to attempt to solve it, often not the most obvious <laughs> or efficient, but it's still fascinating even when they fail that they try so many different things, right? Far more than like older children, adults, will admit defeat faster. They just won't, gener they won't put the time and effort into generating all the different alternatives, even in the context of, of failure. So rather than just think of innovate, I mean, rather than um, attempt to compare what the kind of, what the, ont the ontogeny of innovation looks like to the very high bar of human technological innovation, we need more, a more nuanced, um, foundation for what these different abilities look like. And, and it's, it's astonishing in, in, in cultures where we fetishize innovation, we prioritize it, we um, encourage it, we don't really have a good sense of how to teach it. I think because we don't understand how it develops very, very well. Right? Teachers are supposed to teach creativity and innovation. How does one do that in early childhood or middle childhood it's not as though this is a very well-developed um, topic of study within education, even. So much more work needs to be done on that, I think. Uh, hi. Here. Yeah. Hi. Okay. So I'm Briseida again. <laughs> so uh, I like to. I, I'd love to hear about your experience uh, with schooling and formal schooling and different um, populations. And I like to know how do we, do you evaluate the impact of schooling, formal schooling, uh, for native people, for native people culture and cosmology. Because it, it's not something, it's not, doesn't come from their culture, so. Yeah. Yes, so one of the ways that we're doing this is using, we're using kind of naturally occurring experiments. So we'll look at variation within a population on, um, like for example, we're doing some, some research in, in Ecuador, looking at the, um, Differences between native populations that happen to be located near a school and members of the same ethnic group that are just farther afield. So you have populations that are very similar. Um, they vary only in, in their experience with this particular kind of institution. But we're not just looking at formal education as an institution. We're also documenting traditional ways of transmitting information. So we're looking at how parents transmit information, how they teach their children in what we, you know, an ecologically valid context. We do lots of observational research, children in gardens, in um, when they go hunting, when they are foraging, when they're doing tasks that are, um, that are locally important and relevant. Um, and the way teaching occurs in that context is through more of an apprenticeship model of teaching where it's very much hands-on experience. You learn from an expert through, um, you know, again, first-hand experience. And there's lots of teaching that occurs in that context. It's probably a much more effective way to teach complex skills than in an abstract, decontextualized school where you sit and someone, t someone lectures to you about how to fish for three hours I've had this experience, believe it or not. It's a very weird time. Um, turns out none of this transferred to actually knowing anything about how to catch a fish at all. So <laughs> it was really, not, not none of it, very little. Because so much of it required getting the feel of the reel and the line and, and a sense of where the fish, where they hang out and their different movements and what they like to eat. And, you, a lot of that you can only learn through first-hand experience with a, a, you know, a highly experienced tutor. 
So that kind of teaching is exquisitely well adapted to the kinds of skills that people are learning in those environments. And one of the things that we're documenting is how introducing formal schooling can have detrimental effects on the maintenance of those more apprenticeship style skills. I mean, we, this is, we often, in the, the kind of development literature, schooling is almost never thought of as something that can be, formal schooling is never, almost never portrayed as something that can be, can be costly and there can be trade-offs. But if you're taking a child who would otherwise be doing all kinds of hands-on learning, learning locally useful, appropriate skills, we take them away from that and put them in a school in seats in front of a teacher for hours per day where they're learning very different toolkits which are much less relevant to the local environment, there are trade-offs. And lots of, of traditional populations mention this. I mean, they're, they're fully aware of what these trade-offs can be. So we, we are sensitive to that and documenting that. And it's why I'm always careful to use the, the term formal education. It's not that the populations that don't have formal schools aren't educated. They're far more educated about probably all useful things than I am, having been to school for many decades. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to hear that. Uh, but I, I was thinking about the really formal schools because uh, we work with Guarani people here in Sao Paulo, indigenous people, and they really talk Guarani. And now they, um, they have indigenous schools in some um, villages. Yep. And we were discussing something about uh, how the formal school Sometimes it disrupt I, yeah. something that was going on. So yeah. uh, and and it, it it really it is a problem because we have um, well there is a need to to go to school and things like that, but also we have to take care about um, how uh, the cosmology and uh, how the the village works and. And that's it. So I, I was really thinking about the impact of, of the formal school and these communities because I understood that you were also uh, checking something like that. Yeah, uh, we're studying that in, in that tr the trend towards the indigenous education, which is a hybrid model of formal schooling plus attempting to preserve traditional knowledge and toolkits. This model is, is um, I mean, I, I can think of five or six different countries where Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, there's a lot of interest in, in figuring out how to do this, but there's a lot of uncertainty because this is in fact a new, a new model. In, in, in Vanuatu, one of the things that we, um, we've documented is a, kind of a similar model of, of custom schools where the idea is to take the efficiency of a formal school and use that as a way to teach traditional skills. And this was a reaction to detrimental, the perception of detrimental effects of, of traditional formal schools. Because parents would say, we put our children in these schools all day and they come out and they're, they're stupid. They don't know anything useful. They don't know how to hunt. They don't know how to make you know, a bow. They don't know any of the local customs. What is this for? Like formal schooling is set up for kind of these increasingly industrialized economies that don't exist in many of these rural areas. And those that do make it through, all the way through the formal educational system, which are very few, they leave the community. It's an extractive model of success. So it can be a bit of a hard sell to say, look, we're gonna take all the skills that you've traditionally taught your children and replace those with our knowledge and most of your ch the children are not going to be able to succeed in this model, you know, using this institutional system anyway. And those that do are going to move very far away to an urban area and you'll never see them again. Sounds great. So I think these hybrid schools are a reaction to the, 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 the weaknesses of introducing formal educational schools in these areas. <laughs> 
Um, thank you so much, Christine, for the great talk. And let's make the 50 minute break, a uh, 10 minute break, and reconvene at 5 past 4 for our last talk. Hi again. So now we are ready for our first talk. So last but not least, I, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Professor Rachel Kendall, with whom I have collaboration for, for some time. She co-supervised two students of ours. And she's also the, the current president of the Cultural Revolution Society. So after the questions, I ask her to, to, to present to you uh, uh, briefly the, the, the society. And, but now she will talk ab about, uh, about strategies uh, uh, to investigate social learning and cultural diffusion. Uh, thank you, Edu, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here and to all of you for making it to the very end of the day. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, how I've been investigating social learning strategies um, in cultural diffusion, and this relates to quite a few of the questions that we've had throughout the day about model biases or prestige biases or copying adults versus children. Um, so I'll just get started. Okay, so um, when I talk about social learning strategies, um, they're often called transmission biases as well, depending uh, <coughs> just on terminology that different researchers use. Um, and so it's, it is not adaptive to indiscriminately use social learning blindly. Um, you need to be selective and flexible in when you use personal information or asocial information, and when you use social information. And when you do use social information, who do you learn from? Um, so we need strategies, uh, kind of rules of thumb, to enable us to efficiently acquire information. Um, so if we have such strategies, um, these can help us avoid the costs of both types of information. So with asocial learning, it can be costly in terms of the time taken to learn something for yourself that's difficult. You might expose yourself to toxic foods, for example, or to predators. But the information you collect is going to be accurate, it's going to be reliable hopefully. Um, whereas with social learning, it, you can have a very efficient, rapid collection of um, hopefully reasonable information, um, but you have to vet. If you um, didn't have any heuristics or rules of thumb telling you how to use social information, then you'd have to vet every single cultural variant in the population around you for its potential contribution to fitness. So if you have some rules of thumb that enable you to home in on whom to learn from, for example, then this can give you um, accurate information, um, assuming that this individual you've chosen to learn from has not acquired their information in, in for example, a different environment. So it's, it's um, not appropriate for you, or it, they acquired it a long time ago, so it's outdated. So social information can be unreliable. So you've got to kind of balance this kind of accuracy and economy trade-off in using social information and personal information. So um, this, these kind of rules of thumb, they, they're not necessarily going to provide you the best information, but uh, if you had to wait for the evolution, whether they're um, uh, genetic or cultural, evolution of perfect uh, learning strategies, the environment may well have changed by then. So, this um, trade-off between accuracy and economy in using personal or social information could allow you to get pretty good information quite fast. So if these kind of strategies operate within populations over generations, then this can allow cultural adaptations to evolve and this can influence um, the evolution of culture. So uh, this is the latest classification of social learning strategies. Um, obviously, it's far too small for you to see, um, but what you can see, if I get the pointer, is that um, social learning strategies are classified into content-dependent biases, so where you, you, um, you actually assess the, the value of the information, the social information that you're observing, and uh, 
sorry, content-dependent biases down here, and context-dependent biases, which may involve your personal state. Are you hungry? Are you young? Um, are you naive? Frequency-dependent biases that you heard a bit about before, so for example, copy the majority or conformity. And then model-based biases, so do you copy um, kin? Do you copy a prestigious high-status individual, or do you copy old? But first, I want to emphasize that um, these social learning strategies can be products of evolution and or learning. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, and also, when I'm talking about strategies, I don't necessarily mean that they're conscious. Um, so these may be biases that are shaping behavior, but they're not necessarily conscious decisions. Um, and these are not hard and fast rules that you can think of being applied <laughs> blindly across all individuals or across all contexts, but more um, kind of biases that shape behavior. And we've heard a lot about cumulative culture, and uh, one of the reasons that I'm interested in social learning strategies is whether it can help us explain, whether it can help us explain um, the apparent uh, level of cumulative culture we see in humans compared to non-humans. So I might touch upon cumulative culture quite often in when I'm uh, concluding each study that I talk about. Okay, so this uh, whole um, workshop is about approaches to investigating cultural evolution. So I just, uh, this slide is really where I was thinking about what kind of approaches do we use um, in my part of the field. Um, and it really depends on the type of social learning strategy you're interested in or the question you're interested in, um, what species, so whether you're looking at humans or non-humans, and also the context. So the sort of interest in social learning strategies really um, was founded and came about at the beginning of the cultural evolution field in the, in the 80s when Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson, uh, Cavalli Sforza and Feldman were doing lots of mathematical modeling. Um, so they had this virtual context where they came up with all sorts of um, hypotheses about how individuals trade off social and asocial information, um, which it wasn't really until 2000 that people started to empirically test those theoretical hypotheses. Um, and we do that in different species, but also in more laboratory captive type contexts and more free ranging uh, children contexts in schools and classes um, and in wild animals. So to move through that classification system, um, if we first start with context-dependent social learning strategies, um, we can focus on state-based biases, frequency-dependent biases, and model-based biases. So state-based biases, um, we've seen, when I did a review in 2005-2009, of any empirical evidence I could find that related to um, transmission biases or social learning strategies, I found that there was this overriding tendency in non-humans for individuals to only use social information and only copy others if they were uncertain for some reason. So uh, perhaps they were, had no personal information, they were completely naive, then they would tend to use social information. Or um, their personal information was inadequate, so there are studies with sticklebacks where um, the longer it has been since they acquired their personal information, the more likely they are to use social information. Or um, it's costly somehow to acquire personal information. So um, another study with sticklebacks found that pregnant females became very risk averse. They're more um, prone to predation. They'd be much more likely to use social information in that context. And also some studies I conducted with um, chimpanzees and calitrican monkeys, we found that as task difficulty increased, as it's more costly to acquire personal information, individuals are much more likely to use social information. And then even more recently, we've seen this kind of copy only if uncertain type uh, state-based bias in, in insects, so in ants and bees. So I was... Uh, joined um, the anthropology department in Durham shortly after, well, actually, around the time I wrote these reviews. And I became friends with a developmental psychologist. And we were talking about this, and, uh, and I said, oh, I wonder if this is the same for humans. 
And uh, I really thought, well, it must be, you know, this is how non-humans behave. And the developmental psychologist, Emma Flynn, that I paired up with with our first PhD student, Lara Wood, um, said, oh no, children, they will use social information regardless of whether they have their own personal information. So we set out to um, kind of replicate these studies um, with children. So this is um, a puzzle box that we were using. And um, what you can see here is, um, this is a, a capsule, a plastic capsule containing a sticker. And the children love stickers. So they want to get this capsule out of this black door here. And in order to do so, they need to either use this handle to push the capsule forward to fall through a hole, so sweep it forward, or pull out this drawer, um, it causing the capsule to fall down. And then they can either um, lift the door or slide the door to take the um, capsule out and get the sticker. Um, and when Lara was uh, performing demonstrations for children, she um, had a glove puppet. Uh, this is a, a red panda puppet on her hand. And um, this was because we were worried about model-based biases. So if a, an adult demonstrates something to a child, you know, they're going to copy it. So we were trying to reduce uh, that bias. So obviously the children didn't completely dissociate her from this puppet, but they did to an extent. They would talk to Pip and say, oh, don't be silly, Pip. And so it was just our attempt to reduce model-based biases. Um, so we studied five-year-olds in this context. And um, there were lots of different conditions, and there were four phases in each condition. So individuals either received personal information, they were able to explore the task, and they might discover, say, the sweep or the draw, um, or they received a demonstration from Pip, the puppet, either of the sweep or the draw, and then they were allowed to interact with the task two times. How did they remove the object from the task? And then they received social information or no information. And the key thing was the social information could agree with their prior information. So if they had um, used the, the sweep, then if it agreed with their prior information, the social information would also, the demonstrator would use sweep. And um, if it opposed, then it would use the alternative, uh, the draw. And then they were allowed to respond again and interact with the task five times and get the five stickers. So the key question is um, whether when the social information they received uh, opposed their prior information, did they use that social information? Because my um, evidence from non-humans was that non-humans, they won't use this, this social information if they already have adequate personal information. And as you can see, I was completely wrong. So um, in this table, in gray, you can see all the conditions where individuals in the second phase either received no more new information or they received a demonstration that agreed with their prior information. And very few individuals, so 7% to 14%, uh, very few individuals went on to use that, um, the alternative method. So if they'd uh, used sweep, um, in the first phase, and then they observed a demonstrator using sweep, then very few of them went uh, and used the draw, for example, to get the capsule out. But in contrast, if the social information opposed their prior information, then we see many more individuals, up to around 75, 76% of individuals, will actually um, use this alternative information. So they've, they've seen and used uh, sweep, and then they, uh, they observe an individual using draw, and they will use the draw. 75% of them will do that. And it's not just that they switch their strategy. Actually, because they had five chances to remove uh, the capsule, we saw that they would um, alternate between the two strategies. So they seem to have um, acquired both strategies into their repertoire. So this might seem kind of quite inefficient. Why would you learn another strategy if you've already got a very good one? But it might be really valuable in our very tool abundant culture to learn strategies that you can then generalize uh, to, to new contexts. And obviously the ability to acquire new information, even when you have good information um, already, could enable ratcheting and enable cunative culture. So um, another context-dependent social learning strategy is frequency-dependent bias. 
So um, in the cultural evolution field, this means a disproportionate tendency to copy um, the majority or the minority. So on this uh, figure here, you have the frequency of, of the cultural variant. And here you have the, the, so this is the frequency that you might observe the variant in the population. And on the y-axis, you have the probability that individuals adopt that trait. So here, if you have unbiased transmission, you can see this line. If you have conformity, by the time you get above 50% um, of uh, frequency of a variant in a population, individuals are much uh, more likely than 50% to um, adopt that variant. And the opposite is true of uh, anti-conformity. When, when a trait is very rare, you become much more likely to um, adopt it and display it. So this is different to um, what social psychologists might call conformity sometimes, so which is more of a, a peer pressure type effect. So studies by Solomon Ash, where um, you have personal information that you know which of these three lines is the longest, uh, you know perfectly well which one is longest, but if everybody else in your small community are all saying, no, actually, line C is the longest, you might discount your personal information in favour of that perceived community norm. But there's no necessarily, um, this doesn't require disproportionate copy, copying of majorities. It doesn't have to be frequency dependent. So there are two slightly uh, different uses of the word conformity, which has caused all sorts of confusion in our field. So I'm talking about disproportionate tendency to copy the majority. Um, and this is important because it enables you to acquire the collective wisdom of your population. So if you copy the behavior which is displayed by the majority of individuals, rather than the, 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 the majority of behaviors that you observed, then you have uh, collective wisdom. So to explain that, there was a really nice study by Daniel Hound. So here he has um, three different chimps, uh, blue, uh, blue, <laughs> dark brown, light brown, darker brown here, and they're all three different individuals using um, the yellow box, putting a, a ball into the yellow box to acquire a food reward. And in the minority condition, they've got the same individual three times uh, placing the ball in the blue box to acquire a reward. So if um, you're copying the majority of behavior displayed by individuals, then you should uh, go for the yellow box and not the blue box. And that's what happened in chimpanzees and humans. You can see um, a tendency to copy the majority. In orangutans, it wasn't very strong, and that's potentially to do with their uh, more solitary lifestyle. Um, but that's more speculative. OK, but this is not to say that conformity is blindly applied uh, by individuals. So it's not blind. There's flexibility in the use of these strategies. So one study um, using the same sweep draw box that I showed you before uh, by Cara Evans, a PhD student working with me and Kevin Leyland and Melinda Carpenter um, showed this quite nicely. So in this uh, use of the task, before individuals got to use the sweep or uh, before they observed a demonstrator showing how to get the capsule to the lower level of the task using the sweep or the draw, they saw the black door here uh, being moved side to side several times before the causally relevant behavior um, took place. Uh, so we wanted to play with the unanimity, unani I can never say this word, unanimity of um, behavior that individuals observed. So what we did was we had um, one uh, condition where there were four demonstrators, four clearly different demonstrators on a video, all um, using only the relevant behaviors. So majority using the relevant behaviors. And here you can see um, clear uh, copying of the majority. Everyone copied the relevant behavior that they, they had observed, either the sweep or the draw. Then we had a minority irrelevant condition where um, three of the four individuals um, did not produce these causally irrelevant actions, and one of them did. Um, and again, uh, you can see conformity to the majority. So 
there was only one individual producing those irrelevant actions, and so um, the, the child was able to omit those irrelevant actions and copy the majority. But the interesting thing happens is when we have the majority of demonstrators producing this irrelevant behavior. In this context, um, children seeing just one demonstrator not produce those irrelevant behaviors allowed them not to copy the majority and pass out the irrelevant behavior. So this is a flexible high fidelity copying. It's not a blind uh, copying of the majority. So this might imply in a real world context where you don't really see unanimity um, when you're out, out in the world, not, not everybody does everything in the same way, then um, conformity then can allow the evolution of efficient solutions quite rapidly because those um, irrelevant behaviors, unless they're reinforced somehow, perhaps given ritual importance or normative importance, um, then those redundant behaviors will be passed out quite rapidly. So um, another aspect of context-dependent bias, uh, social learning strategies are indirect biases. So this is where you copy according to the identity of the model. You're not assessing uh, the trait in any way. And it's called in, an indirect bias because this is a silly example, but um, everybody knows uh, David Beckham, hopefully. Uh, so he, he became famous in high status because of his left foot um, and his, his footballing ability. So he's become high status, but now people in advertising use him to advertise all sorts of things that are really not related to his footballing ability and what caused him to become high status in the first place. But it's obviously used in marketing a lot, this, this tendency for us to um, then copy everything that a generally successful individual has done. So these are model-based biases. And they might be things like copying older individuals or copying high status individuals um, because they have generally... Um, acquired, they've, they've lived long enough, uh, so they're generally successful. Uh, so if you copy them, you're hopefully going to acquire beneficial behavior. So it's a shortcut to acquiring that good behavior. <coughs> um, so I try to look at model-based biases in um, captive uh, chimpanzees using a kind of open diffusion context. So here, um, I really wanted to have a, as naturalistic a possible um, experimental setup so we could really get to the social dynamics at play. So these individuals could interact um, or not with my experiment. They were free to do so. So what we did was expose them to this um, slide box task. So basically this little door can be pushed to the left or the right and a grape will fall out. And you might think, well, you know, that's, that's so minor and actually that little door can be pushed very easily from side to side. But we actually found across four different groups, there was a really strong evidence for social learning. And the majority of a group would either push left or push right, uh, which was quite surprising, but we had strong evidence for social learning. So then we wanted to look um, at the data as to uh, who observed whom interacting with the task. So we could put the task um, either outside this win one of these windows here and the chimps could reach through and push, or, uh, push the door to the left or right and um, anybody could watch them. And we could see on a video who was in a certain radius with their face oriented towards a task, and so who might have observed specific behaviors. So we could then look for model-based biases in who learned what. Um, and what we found evidence for was a tendency to copy high rankers. So here we looked at the probability of observation of demonstrators who were higher rank, the same rank, or lower rank than the observers. And we could split this by whether the observers were naive, they hadn't uh, successfully interacted with the task before, or whether they had, whether they were informed. And what you can see in these contrasts is that we have um, much more evidence for copying of individuals who are of higher rank. And this is um, much more convincing when individuals are naive. So it seems to be um, an attendance bias um, for copying high-ranking individuals because we see uh, this bias much more strongly in those who have yet to acquire information dealing with the task. So high rankers, as I was saying before, are generally successful individuals, so it might pay to copy them. <coughs> 
but it might be more important to copy individuals that you know are knowledgeable. That might be a more accurate bias. And we looked at this in children, again with Lara Wood, a PhD student with myself and Emma Flynn. And so here we used um, Andy Whiten's glass ceiling box. So this box, again, contains a sticker behind this black door, which a child, um, when they open the door, can put a rod in with Velcro on the end and get the sticker out. So this is the causally relevant area, and there's a glass ceiling in the top of this box, and all sorts of behaviours can be um, performed at the top of this box, but they're clearly causally irrelevant. They have nothing to do with getting the reward out. And so what we had was um, uh, demonstrators on Visio, either children or adults, um, and they would come on the video and they'd say, oh, there's this puzzle box. I've never seen this before. Or they'd say, oh, I've done this loads of times. You know, I know exactly what to do. Um, so individuals saw either a child or adult say this, um, and then they would see a demonstration on the video, just hands, so everybody saw the same demonstration um, of various actions, um, so dragging the bolts or tapping on the top of the box, so they're causing irrelevant actions, and then lifting the door, or either poking the bolts, tapping, or sliding the door. So because there are these different ways of interacting with the box, we can tell whether individuals are copying or not. And then we allowed the child to, after seeing this video, interact with the task and we can see what behaviours they reproduce. And we did this twice. They saw the demonstration again and were able to interact with the box again. <coughs> so what we found was that um, children would copy the causally relevant actions regardless of whether an individual was adult or child or knowledgeable. But when we come to the irrelevant, the causally irrelevant actions, the tapping to the top of the box, we find um, that actually individuals were most strongly influenced by whether the um, demonstrator was an adult or a child. So they were much more likely to uh, copy adults than they were children, um, almost regardless of uh, the professed knowledge state of those adults. But we did see some evidence for children taking account of the, the knowledge state of the demonstrators. So it was only where individuals said that they were knowledgeable, that they'd seen the task before, that the number of irrelevant actions that they, they produced increased from after the first demonstration and to the second demonstration. So they were taking account of knowledge, professed knowledge to some extent. So this would seem to be a kind of strategy of copy adults faithfully and children too, unless the child's actions seem somehow non-functional. So this would kind of make sense. Um, developmentally, understanding of age comes earlier than understanding of knowledge, so it's, it's easier to use a, a general bias of copy adults. Um, but also, adults might be producing causally irrelevant actions um, for some opaque reason. Uh, that the child doesn't understand, whereas if a child is producing irrelevant actions, the child might think, well, this is due to incompetence, so they won't um, pay attention to those actions or copy them. So again, we see evidence of selectivity in, in um, high-fidelity copying. So if you're selective, if you're able to um, take account of how likely the, the behavior that an individual is displaying um, is likely to be um, important or beneficial, then this can be useful for cumulative culture again. <coughs> okay, but this professed knowledge state is not a hugely accurate bias. People could be overconfident with, about their own knowledge. So we were interested in whether individuals could use a more accurate uh, type of model-based bias based on the reputation individuals had of skill. So this is almost getting to the metacognition that uh, Christine was talking about earlier. So um, do individuals behave according to what they believe um, others to know? Do they know who knows? And, and can they um, copy according to that? So this was a comparative study, again, by Lara Wood. She was very productive in her PhD. Um, so comparing chimpanzees and children on roughly the similar task. So what we wanted to do first was establish um, a reputation for um, skillfulness. 
in, in the chimps and the children, both for the, the subjects of our study, but also for us. So we um, gave the chimpanzees and the children lots of extractive foraging type tasks. And so we gave them about six, I think. So these, these are just two examples where individuals had to work out how to get food rewards or stickers for the children out of the tasks. And we could record um, how quickly individuals approached these tasks, um, how many different strategies they tried, whether they were successful. So we could really get a, um, a ranking of who should have within the class, the school class, or within the chimpanzee group, who should have a high reputation for being skillful in extractive foraging type tasks, and who should have a low reputation. So we could choose a high and low reputation model um, in each group. And we had four groups, and we could try to match them for sex. So in one group, we did the high and low reputation model would both be female, for example. Try to match them for age and dominance, too. So we have, uh, compared to my other study that I showed you about with the chimpanzees, we ho hopefully have um, greater power to see whether individuals um, really their observations translate into um, their behavior because we, individuals will have conflicting information from two different types of demonstrators. So what we did was train um, the high reputation model, say, to scoop um, a little basket um, with a red uh, tool, scoop this banana basket um, to retrieve the reward from outside the cage, or use a hooking, this blue hook type method. And with the children, we used the sweet, uh, sweet draw box again, but we added um, a lever so they could flick the capsule down the hole uh, to the little black door. And we did this because we wanted uh, children to have prior information of one strategy um, and then observe a high reputation model use a second strategy and a low reputation model um, sorry, a high or low reputation model uh, use a second strategy. And then the third strategy was available uh, for exploration if they so chose to do so. So we actually found in both species that individuals were able to appraise and track the reputations of individuals and use that to guide their behavior. So in the chimps, we found evidence for what we called biostimulus enhancement. We haven't published this study yet. Um, Lara's been busy becoming a, a new academic. Um, but what we found was that individuals were much more likely to touch the tool that was used, first touch the tool that was used by the high reputation model in their group. And with the children, it was a little bit more complicated. So if, sorry, too many different tools here. If um, a high reputation model uh, used the child's previous method that they had used, then children were very much biased to stick to their own method. It was somehow kind of justified to them that they were using a good method, so they stuck to that method. If the low reputation model used their prior method, then they didn't want to use their, their own prior method or the alternative method that the high reputation model showed, and they went on to innovate and, and, try and explored uh, and found the third method. This is despite the fact that it, it was decreasing, uh, increasingly difficult to discover an alternative method because there was really only one left. So this, was, this innovation was quite striking to us. So you can see here that individuals were able to track the reputation of individuals and bias their behavior according to it. And so this could be a fairly accurate transmission of uh, the most useful information available in the population. So this could be an adaptive social learning strategy. And you can see that it would allow the retention of knowledge, the best knowledge available. And also we get this uh, potential for innovation. Um, and as you just heard from Christine, the dual pillars of, of um, culture and cumulative culture in particular are um, high fidelity uh, copying and maintenance of behavior at, at the level that it's currently attained um, until such a time that an innovation occurs. So here we have some tentative evidence for both processes uh, occurring. And um, with the work that I've been doing with Edu and our two PhD, T, uh, PhD students, we've been looking for model-based biases in, in the wild in capuchins. So these are capuchins in Cerro de Capivara National Park in Piauí. 
and we're using these two action tasks that you've seen before. So this is a box. Um, there's a green lever here that individuals can pull out, and they get a food reward down here. Or there's this blue um, door that they can lift up, and they get a food reward. And so what we can do here is we... Um, this individual is using the, the blue lifting door, and we can say these individuals are within, say, five meters proximity, and they all have their head oriented towards the task, so we can say uh, there's a proxy for them observing their behavior. So we can look to see um, across the social network of who observes who in these tasks, and also um, social network outside of task presentations, so who hangs out with who, who feeds with who, who plays with who, who grooms with who. We took all this data to try and um, understand how information transmits through groups. And we use network-based diffusion analysis, which you've heard a little bit about, but basically um, looks to see whether um, we have evidence for social learning if the spread of information from one individual to another um, is in accordance with the social network. If it is, then we can say we have evidence for social learning. And we actually found that um, we only found evidence for social learning when individuals were observing within this close proximity. So this seems to be more um, observational learning than just stimulus enhancement, just being attracted to the task from a distance and then learning for yourself. So we have fairly nice evidence for social learning going on, which was quite a, a new finding at the time. We've been so slow to publish that it's not that new anymore, but never mind. Um, and we looked for lots and lots of model-based biases. We looked for age, um, sex, uh, and status, and proficiency. And the only thing we found was that more proficient individuals, those who had higher, a higher ratio of successful manipulations to unsuccessful manipulations, they were observed more. So here you can see um, a social network for one group and the second group that we observed. <coughs> and um, in degree is calculated in these networks uh, using UCINet. So it's normalized for the frequency of manipulations that individuals produced. So um, if I say an individual was observed at a high rate, it wasn't just because they uh, produced lots of manipulations. So um, each node here, um, if the shape is large, um, then individuals had a very uh, high success rate. They were proficient. And then if it's a darker color, they were observed more. So you can see quite a strong, uh, just from looking at these social networks, quite a strong uh, indication that individuals... Um, who were highly proficient were observed more by the capuchins. But um, unfortunately with this task, most of the capuchins uh, use the lift door. So we don't have um, a situation where we can say this, this bias for attending proficient individuals um, translated into copying of the behavior because individuals didn't see different uh, solutions being demonstrated because everyone used lift. But due to the um, network-based diffusion analysis data on social learning, we can feel fairly confident that this bias in attendance did translate to uh, learning. And um, a second study with Clara Corat. Lovely to see you. <laughs> um, uh, again, with the uh, wild capuchins in Cerro de Capivara National Park, she was actually quite interested in cumulative culture. So she had this task where there's um, juice in the bottom of this box and holes in the top, and individuals were very proficient at probing uh, through these holes and then um, licking the juice off the stick. Um, that didn't require social learning. They already knew how to do that. Um, but we did find evidence that social learning was required for this second stage, the more difficult stage, of sticking the probe in, into the box and then rotating the lid round so you could open the lid and stick your head in and get lots more juice. So there was evidence for social learning in this second stage. <coughs> and again, we looked at lots of different potential model-based biases, but what we came up with was this proficiency bias again. So there is a strong correlation between um, the ratio of success of individuals, so um, whether they produce more successful manipulations than unsuccessful manipulations, and um, the average observation rate. So individuals who had a high success were more likely to be observed. 
So we have tentative evidence of um, an ac a really accurate bias here, um, resulting in the retention of skills and potentially establishment of traditions. And with Clara's uh, data, potentially something to do with cumulative culture, but that's all very tentative. Um, but model-based biases, even where they're quite accurate because you're copying a proficient individual, are not as accurate as content biases, where you're actually assessing um, the value of the behavior itself. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about a little bit at the moment. So content-dependent social learning strategies, they're often called direct biases. So you're directly copying an individual based on some evaluation of the trait that they're displaying. So there have been lots of studies, not by me, um, using transmission chains, um, so like Chinese whispers that Edu talked about earlier this morning, um, in uh, urban legends or, or spreading of um, gossip or the spread of fairy tales, and individuals retain information to do with um, social information, so gossip, survival information, um, minimally counter counterintuitive concepts, so say in Red Riding Hood, animals that talk, um, that's, that's quite attractive and um, um, something that you retain, and something that people find emotional or disgusting. People retain that information and are more likely to transmit that information. So that's a direct bias, that the content of the trait is influencing the transmission. Um, another direct bias which I've looked at is something to do with um, evaluating the actual payoff of a behavior that an individual is producing. So you might um, choose to observe and copy an individual who's um, displaying the most efficient technique around you. Um, arguably more complex, you might um, evaluate the payoff of your own behavior and compare it to somebody else's and um, abandon your behavior if somebody else's behavior is better than yours, if their payoff is higher. Um, so that's a more complex thing to do. And um, it may be relevant for the emergence of cumulative culture, that ability to um, abandon your own behavior if something else better comes along is going to be required for ratcheting up of complexity of traits. Um, so Jill Vale, another PhD student that I had um, along with Emma Flynn, and then Jeremy Kendall came in to help with some analysis later on. We conducted a comparative study of children and chimpanzees and whether they could use um, payoff biases and particularly whether they could use this copy if better type strategy. So this is how it worked. So in the chimpanzees, they are in a social group um, and it's a, a token exchange um, scenario. So individuals in, in this group, they all learned um, to... Uh, swap this, uh, this yellow token at an exchange window with a human, and they would acquire, say, a piece of carrot, so a small reward. So they've personally learned over several trials that they exchange the yellow token to get a reward. And then they see one individual all of a sudden in their group pick up the, uh, a different token, a black token, and exchange it at the window with the human for a much bigger reward, a much more attractive reward, several pieces of apple. <coughs> So the question is, this individual, if they're able to use copy if better, really should switch uh, from using this uh, yellow token to using the black token, because obviously the black token is giving a higher reward. Um, the scenario we used with children was a little bit different. We're not allowed to feed children, so again, they're working for stickers. Um, so what we had was uh, a white pipe cleaner. Uh, in class, they exchanged this white pipe cleaner many times for a pretty boring yellow sticker. And then one individual in their class came along, picked up the black token, the black uh, pipe cleaner, and exchanged it for four brightly colored, smiley, glittery stickers, which are like amazing uh, for these children. So, you know, really strong, they should strongly prefer, and they did, because we did tests of, of how much they preferred these stickers, um, they should switch from uh, exchanging this white token that they've done lots of times to this black token, if they can use copy of better. <coughs> but more specifically, we try to look at um, 
several strategies that an economist, Carl Schlag, in the 1990s, I think, talked about, different ways in which individuals could display a copy of better type strategy. And in the chimps, we actually found that they, they really only copied, they only switched to this alternative token if they were dissatisfied. So, sorry, this is, looks a bit complicated, uh, but basically, if individuals had personal information um, to use a token that provided them just a piece of carrot, they're not very satisfied with that. So they will always copy the alternative, the social alternative, whether um, the social alternative is also giving a small reward or, or whether it gives a large reward. There's no difference. And if they already use um, the personal token for a high reward, then they, sh they shouldn't switch at all. And this is what we saw. So they tended to copy if dissatisfied. So they're only paying attention to their personal information. We found a bit more evidence for copy of better in children. So another strategy is called proportional observation. So here, individuals are only paying attention to the, the social information. They're ignoring their personal information. So if the social information is of high reward, then they, they should swap. Um, unfortunately, we, we didn't have uh, this, this alternative here. But basically, they, they shouldn't swap if, if the uh, social information is of low reward, regardless of their personal information. And then um, there's proportional imitation. And this is the true copy if better, truly evaluating your own payoff versus the payoff of another <coughs> behavior. So here, individuals um, really should switch to the alternative token when their personal information is giving a low reward, so a carrot, and the social information is giving a high reward. But when the personal and social information are the same, it should be random, this, this amount of switching. Um, so we found evidence for proportional observation, the evidence for proportional imitation, the, the, the really cool thing that we were looking for, um, we're, we're not sure about this ability, at least in, in this context, in these age children. We're, we're not quite sure whether they were really using copy if better. So, have I raced through too fast? Um, to conclude, um, what are the role of social learning strategies in culture? Um, so, they could be important at different phases of tra uh, tradition formation. So, Mike Huffman, when he was studying um, stone handling in, in Japanese macaques, talked about a transmission phase of tradition formation um, and a tradition phase. So in the tr transmission phase, this is when an innovation is newly discovered. Um, there might be quite high variability in, in the, um, the quality of models. Some individuals might perform the new behavior really well and others really poorly. So there you might really want to engage in direct or content bias um, and copy only individuals who are really proficient. In the tradition phase, the behavior is established. There's probably less variability in, in the quality of models. Um, so you could probably just use an indirect model-based bias of copy generally successful individuals. You might not have to pay attention to proficiency and just copy adults or individuals that are of high rank. And this is actually something that um, Camilla Coelho, along with Edu and perhaps a previous student, I think, um, found some really nice evidence for. So in uh, 1997, 1999, um, you can see from this graph that the majority of individuals who were performing um, nutcracking were juveniles of two to five years old. Um, 10 to 14 late years later, uh, those individuals have grown up and become adults. So you can see that um, at this stage, at the beginning, you might really want to um, use some kind of proficiency bias uh, to copy another juvenile who is um, proficient. At this stage, all of those juveniles have grown up, they've become adults, everybody's pretty proficient, so you can just use a copy adults strategy, which is easier to, uh, cognitively easier to implement. Um, and then uh, looking at some modeling uh, evidence, we can say that social learning strategies are important in the maintenance of adaptive behavior and also the establishment of traditions and culture. So this is um, a nice little uh, simulation by Luc Rendel et al, um, where they're looking at, across the number of cultural generations, how the frequency of a beneficial trait increases. Um, and what they found was that directly biased transmission, 
where you're really paying attention, you're evaluating the content of the trait, its payoff, etc. Um, you get a very rapid uh, increase in that beneficial trait across generations. You get a slightly less rapid increase in the beneficial trait with frequency-dependent bias, so conformity, and um, unbiased transmission, where, where you have no uh, biases in who you learn from or when you learn um, socially is not beneficial in, in the establishment of these beneficial behaviours. And then I just want to mention um, how these social learning strategies could be important for the maintenance of cultural diversity that we see around us, which we've heard a lot about today. So, if we think about humans, uh, Pagel and Mace back in 2004 had a really nice paper in Nature, I think, where they talked about the cultural wealth of nations. And they said, look, we see such huge uh, cultural diversity um, around the globe, despite relatively, comparatively small genetic diversity and um, exchange of individuals, migration between societies. And, and they were really saying at this point that... Um, well, it must be to do with conformity, so migrants will conform um, to the behavior that, they, uh, be, uh, that appears to be normative in, in the population that they have arrived in. Um, so this could explain how cultural diversity is maintained. Similar arguments um, that I made and others have made, uh, Lydia Lunks, in, in wild chimpanzees. So in Thai chimpanzees, there are four populations that Lydia Lunks studied. <coughs> And she looked at um, nutcracking. So in, in all populations, they use a stone to crack nuts when they are fresh and really hard. Um, but actually finding stones in this environment is, is quite difficult. It's not an efficient uh, technique. Um, but in three of those four populations, as the stones dry and become softer, individuals use sticks uh, to bash open the nuts. And that's, you know, that's an efficient technique because the sticks are everywhere. But in one population, they persist with using nuts throughout the whole season. And this persists despite the fact that these four populations live um, very close, neighboring populations, very similar ecology, and exchange migrants. And with this example, um, we really talked about multiple uh, social learning strategies that could be responsible for this. So it could be that um, when migrants um, arrive in, in this new group, they conform to the behavior that they've observed. Um, it could be that uh, they copy because they're uncertain. Although the ecology is re really similar, they, they might not know that, so they copy uh, the behavior of others because they're uncertain. Or it could be, um, if you think about the study that I represented really early on about uh, finding evidence of a copy high rankers strategy in chimpanzees, if um, migrants enter a population and do persist in, in displaying a different behavior, they're subordinate when they enter a population, so they're not likely to be observed and copied. Um, so we could think about multiple simultaneous biases happening and influencing cultural diversity all at once. And finally, I wanted to just give a teaser of some future directions, and someone mentioned individual differences early and we, earlier, and we've been looking at the role of personality and whether it can predict who is an innovator, who is a social learner, so who transmits information, who modifies um, innovations in that cumulative manner. Uh, and Bruce Rawlings, who is now with Christine in, in Austin, um, did uh, a really nice review looking at individual differences and their potential role in innovation and social learning. But he also did um, several studies, so I just mentioned one. So he collected uh, teacher and um, parental ratings of five different personality traits, so it's the big five. So um, openness to experience, um, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And then he exposed individuals to this task, which we call the multiple methods box. And again, we have this yellow capsule containing a sticker, and we have three different tools and um, these different tools can be used in different holes, different ex, uh, entrances here, uh, which you can put a tool in and perhaps hook the capsule towards yourself or push it out of a different hole or push it into this hole, which makes it drop and you can get it from this exit door. So there are lots, of, we called it the multiple methods box because there are lots of different ways that you can get the reward. Now what Bruce did 
which is our only study really where we're really focusing on a conscious use of social learning strategies, is he asked children, OK, this is my friend's box. Um, do you want to have a go at getting the sticker out yourself, or do you want to watch me try it first? So they had a choice. They consciously chose to use personal or social information. Um, and so what he found was that children who were rated as high in conscientiousness, they chose a social information. They chose to go it alone. Um, so we could say that they, they were inventors. They innovated uh, by invention. And then those children who were rated as highly agreeable, um, they chose social information. They asked for a demonstration. But once they'd had that demonstration, they would um, depart from what they'd observed. Perhaps they used a different tool or a different exit uh, for the capsule. So they were able to innovate by modification. Likewise, um, children who um, were rated as high in openness to experience, once they had um, acquired social information, they also really readily innovated uh, by modification. So this seems quite interesting in what we talked about earlier, and Christine, uh, Christine Lagarde mentioned as this kind of tension between innovation and social learning, and that we need both for cumulative culture. So here, those individuals who are agreeable and open to experience are doing both things. They are transmitting information, they're, um, they're acquiring information socially, but they're also capable of um, innovating. And you might, you know, this, this shows that it's, there's not necessarily as much tension as perhaps we think uh, between innovation and social learning. But this is not published yet, uh, but it should be very soon. Uh, so we'll develop this argument further. Okay, thank you very much for listening, um, all the funding and uh, various collaborators and schools and primates that have worked with me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, please don't don't leave right now. Uh, uh, I will have time for questions, but uh, after that, I ask uh, uh, Rachel to to tell you about the Cultural Revolution Society. So, and after that, we have a lot. Uh, have some food uh, around the posters. We have some juice, some sandwiches, and talk to the the speakers. But questions. Who? <clears throat> right, so thanks for your talk, Rachel. And you mentioned at the end um, that the social learning uh, strategies may function as a way of keeping cultural tra traditions, cultural um, practices. Um, how, what is your take on the combination of these social learning mechanisms and uh, uh, social norms in a group? So for example, if you have an immigrant uh, coming to a, a group, uh, they might want to keep their, their social traditions and, and behaviors, but there are norms in that community that might prevent them of adopting that um, that practices or, or um, rule or, or their own norms. So what do you think about that? Uh, yes, so I, it's a good point. I think thinking of any one social learning strategy, so when, when you're talking about norms, I'm thinking about conformity. Um, I yeah, so like, um, sorry, just because uh, I'm of the microphone yet, still, uh, like uh, san moral sanctions, for example. Okay. So it, 
I mean, conformity is a, a form of keeping social norms, but we have other ways of preventing people from adopting other 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 habits. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I'm sorry for interrupting. Just uh, be more clear about what I ma meant. Okay. Yeah. So. I haven't really thought about that um, because I've been mostly studying uh, non-humans, but yeah, sure, there's going to be an interaction between social learning strategies that individuals might employ or want to employ and, and then other influences, like you say, sanctions that prevent them from displaying uh, a certain behavior. Um, I also think that, um, for example, my, my idea that individuals might um, conform um, to a norm or to the majority or sanctioning, if they have a really high payoff behavior, maybe they will be more motivated to retain that behavior. And when they perhaps um, attain higher status, then they might display that behavior and other individuals will, will pay attention. So there's some evidence of that in chimpanzees. It's not to do with uh, sanctions, but there is some evidence um, of uh, an individual who had a really high payoff behavior um, no one paid attention to that individual. They carried on using that behavior because it was really high payoff and it wasn't until they were older and other individuals were then you know, copying a higher ranker or an older individual that that uh, high payoff behavior finally spread in the group. So yeah, there, there's more going on than just social learning strategies. And a lot of my studies, we think about those in isolation, but we can develop further and think about moral sanctions, for example. Yeah, it's a good point. If you simply want to comment something, you just um, thanks, Rachel. Um, I would like to know in your last experiment you showed, you actually correlated some personality traits mm -hmm. with uh, the probability the probability to innovate or to have social connection. Uh, I would like to know how did you evaluate the personality traits of those kids mm -hmm. and uh, whether the personality well, where the personality traits come from in this case and if that's something that is uh, common in other species that uh, you find some link between personality traits and innovation? Right, yeah, so the first question, um, in order to establish personality traits, we um, got ratings. Um, so we asked, there are these questionnaires that you can give um, parents or teachers, and they've been validated over many years. So you can give them a questionnaire, asking them about their child, and fairly reliably, you can then uh, use those questionnaire answers to determine whether an individual is high in conscientiousness or agreeableness or openness to experience. Um, your second question was whether we see similar individual differences in non-humans. Yeah, and where, well, where the personality come from in the first place, whether it's like something that is linked to social abilities or okay. something which is uh, anterior to social interactions, which leads to innovation? Yeah, so the actual individual differences, um, I don't know enough about where they come from, and I'm sure there's a, there's a whole sort of feedback loop uh, of your experience within society and how that influences uh, your social interactions and your innovativeness. But these individual differences um, are thought to be stable across different contexts, um, so it's not just context dependent, um, they're, they're supposed to be uh, stable across time, although they do change across time. Uh, Bruce Rawlings also looked at individual differences in chimps and found differences in uh, stability of different traits. Um, so you can use these big five uh, personality questionnaires, you can ask um, primate keepers who do the husbandry to um, actually rate the, the chimpanzees, for example, in using similar questions, and um, often it becomes a big six. They add in another um, personality characteristic, but these have been validated uh, comparing um, ratings of keepers, but also looking at the behavior of the chimps, um, and they, they correlate very nicely. So yeah, so Bruce has actually looked at um, 
a very similar uh, study with chimpanzees looking at their, whether their personality ratings um, correlate with their choice to use personal or social information. Hi, uh, hi. My name is Jessica. I'm a student with Professor Marcelo, and I have more like three questions, but there <laughs> we can discuss them later. I just wanted to take the opportunity to announce them because they are not exactly questions in the way that I expect closed answers, but things I would like to discuss about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my theoretical background is from behavior analysis, uh -huh. and as a behaviorist, we tend to look at things from the perspective of uh, selection by consequences, um, affecting behavior. Mm -hmm. And the first question that I have, I, I, using this theory né, of uh, selection by consequences. I struggle, I struggle with two things. The first one is with the difference between individual learning and social learning, mm -hmm. uh, especially because our tradition in research comes from a strong uh, line of individual learning uh, research. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've come to... To, I, I have found some authors argumenting that the uh, difference between individual learning and social learning is uh, actually non-existent because uh, social, in, uh, social stimulus uh, are more like any other environmental stimulus, only more variable. Mm -hmm. And I have seen other authors argumenting that social uh, social interactions are actually different from individual interactions because uh, it involves interdependence of consequences. Mm -hmm. So behavior cannot have a, a direct consequence if it, uh, because it depends on the behavior of another organism. So they have, we have these two lines of thinking and this is one of my struggles. I don't know if there are any thoughts on it, but some, maybe we can discuss it, this later. The second uh, question I have... Can I answer the first? Because I won't remember. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah. I didn't get it. Can I answer the first question? I won't remember. Oh, if okay, okay, one, but, sure. <laughs> so, um, I think we'll need to discuss the interdependence issue uh -huh. later, but um, yeah, certainly within our field, there's quite uh, an argument, shall I say, about um, whether social learning is different to individual learning. So Celia Hayes, certainly, um, who is very much of the opinion that social learning is just associative learning, but using um, a social stimulus. And so it's uh, all that's different about social learning is that individuals perhaps are motivated to pay attention to a social stimulus. Um, and then it's associative learning based on the social stimulus. Um, and I think to a large extent that that's true. Um, social learning is largely based on associative learning, but there also seems to be something different going on. Um, and I won't go into all the arguments. Um, we talked about it a lot in um, a recent article we published in um, Trends in Cognitive Sciences. Um, and um, just to mention briefly that there's, there's, there's no kind of uh, reason to prioritize associative learning above any other form of learning. So, you know, that doesn't have to be the first thing that we have to uh, compete against. Um, but, but more importantly, I think there is some neural evidence that there is something different with, with social learning. Um, in the anterior cingulate cortex and the gyrus, if I remember correctly, um, there's quite some evidence that uh, there are neurons that fire when individuals are observing others, so sort of egocentric, and there are other neurons that fire when, when individuals are interacting for themselves. Um, and so there's quite some evidence that there is something different going on with social learning, but I agree, a lot of it's built on associative learning. Um, second question? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
the second question is actually a little confusing for me. I don't know how to articulate it, uh, but it's regarding the difference between learning by observation, learning through observation, and learning through a more direct contact with contingencies. I don't know if there are any social learning mechanisms that involve learning from acting, you know, rather than observing. I don't know if it's clear. <laughs> um, well, n social learning itself is never purely social. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we have an unspoken assumption that social learning includes so social learning plus individual learning. Um, so maybe that's what you're getting at? That yeah, may maybe. I don't know, because uh, in behavior analysis, I haven't found much studies regarding learning through observation that accounts for learning through selection by consequences. So I wouldn't know how to, to interpret this phenomenon through this theory. That's why I'm, I'm looking for thoughts on other areas. <laughs> yeah, lovely. I'd love to speak to you afterwards because I'm not familiar okay. <laughs> with the selection by consequences. Argument. Yes, so, yeah, okay. that would be great. And the third comment I have is um, about overimitation, mm -hmm. which I don't know if it's the same thing as you were calling social biased, no, uh, model biased. Uh, so I don't remember. <laughs> uh, no, so um, yeah, so I don't use the term over imitation because I, yeah. I don't like it. But um, but it's the same uh, uh, phenomenon. But I, but I talk about um, copying of causally irrelevant actions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. And the, uh, what I would like to discuss is that we have a phenomenon in our area of studies that identifies um, superstitious behavior as a result from individual contact with contingencies, but rather than dependent contingencies, it would be non-dependent contingencies, you know. Not contingencies because it's not dependent, so it's non-dependent environmental stimulus or events. And the interesting thing is that uh, from a perspective of reinforcement, we have reinforcement selecting a class of responses. Uh, there are different, different forms of responding, but they all have the same effect on environment. So they can all uh, be selected by, by the same consequence. That's what we call a class of responses. And the effect of reinforcement is to act on this class of responses. But we also see a phenomenon that is when uh, a class of responses is limited by a stereotypy, like uh, we, uh, we call it topographical superstition, because it's when uh, a response is uh, superstitiously, superstitiously <laughs> associated with uh, reinforcement, when it's actually not necessary because the, the true effect, environmental effect is from another, uh, another factor of the response. For example, if I, I I've heard about this, this example now from uh, my friend here, <laughs> you. he talked about his research with uh, Capuchin monkeys, <laughs> and it's about the use of tools, right? Mm -hmm. To, yeah, sticks. He wanted to see if the, if the, the mon capuchin monkeys would learn how, how to use the sticks to access the content of the box, and if it, it would diffuse for the rest of the monkeys, if I'm correct, I don't, I'm speaking for <laughs> another friend's research. And he talked to me about uh, one of the monkeys that used to turn the stick before it would uh, put inside the box. And this turn of the stick is not necessary for the action, but it learned it individually because it happened once and it worked. Mm -hmm. So now he only 
responds in this way, even though he could, he could respond any other way. Mm -hmm. So that's what we call superstitious response because mm -hmm. it's contingent to reinforcement. But there is a topography of this response that is not, con not really necessary, not contingent to reinforcement that is selected anyway. And I see a, a parallel with this phenomenon, uh, between this phenomenon and over imitation. Mm -hmm. Only it's uh, about individual learning. So I think it's an interesting discussion because it, uh, it identifies the same learning mechanism that is not, but it's, but it's not in social, uh, in a social interaction or a social situation, but in an individual situation. So it, permi it, it permits us to discuss this phenomenon as a learning, a general learning mechanism, not only as, as a social learning mechanism. And that's what, that's what I'm going to investigate with my <laughs> uh, orienter. So that was, that was it, but if our, if our time is running late, we can discuss more about this later. Yeah, Thank I'd you. I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, I, you could perhaps think about that individual sort of production of causally irrelevant behavior in the, in the same way as you talk about it in, in the sort of the over-imitation literature that individuals might not realize that this... I mean, there are many explanations for over-imitation, but one which is often discredited, is that individuals are not, uh, they, they don't realize that, that this, this behavior is not causally relevant. But presumably over time, your individual who does this strange thing with the stick before using it, over reinforcement over time, they might drop the strange thing um, and as they learn, um, which you, you do see in, the, in the, the studies with social learning as well. This, over-imitation doesn't necessarily last forever as individuals develop their own reinforcement of their behavior. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a comment on this, this discussion uh, in relation to behavior analysis and uh, selection by consequences. Uh, perhaps one context in which is interesting to think about this is learning about predators. Um, there's a lot of evidence that individuals, uh, nice experiments in birds, for example, uh, will observe another animal being frightened of something, and it could be an ar a arbitrary object that the experiment has provided, like a plastic bottle. They'll see that, and then they'll treat that as, as a dangerous object and avoid it. And that's a very uh, functional context in which it's good to learn from others. It, it's difficult to learn by consequences for yourself. It's difficult to learn by being eaten. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, perhaps that draws quite graphically the, the difference, because uh, there's some associative learning involved. You're associating that particular stimulus, the plastic bottle, with uh, signs of, of uh, it, that it's a bad thing for other individuals that they're, they're showing fright. Uh, but it's not consequences directly for you, because that's a good thing to avoid by social learning. Does, does that help at all? We, again, we can discuss it after. I just wanted to. Yeah. Throw that in. Yeah, the observational conditioning examples. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Something yes. We I mean, discuss. it's called observational conditioning, so yeah. that, that tells us something as well. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, uh, before we uh, before we end, I, I had I asked uh, Rachel to to say a couple of words about the society. Just while she finds her slide, uh, we got a. Uh, a question uh, by email uh, from someone who was watching online. It was during Andy's talk, but I don't know exactly what the, the, the person had in mind. We were checking if any of the other speakers want to, to, to answer something, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's something more appropriate for Christine Leguerre. So uh, uh, I just said this, uh, this uh, colleague from behavior analysis from the University of Brasilia, Lárcia Vasconcelos, that I think it's useful to think and plan future interactions more frequent and dynamic among university and elementary and high school. Uh, these interlocking contingencies, uh, she gave herself up, uh, may permit a gradual and, and formal introduction of concepts, examples, and construction of solutions to different institutional something. Uh, oh. So 
elementary schools and high schools are preparing students for at least the traditional path is to attend college and to attend university. So the more connection there is between universities and earlier education, the better, the more that the process will be more, will be smoother. Um, it's also increasingly true that high school education is no longer sufficient for economic advancement and other sorts of opportunities. So it's more and more expected that you get not just through high school now, but you need to get through college and increasingly graduate school. So the more integrated this pathway is, the better, and the more inclusive it will be for a broad spectrum of learners, which currently it's not servicing the variety of socioeconomic backgrounds that it in principle should be. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm currently president of the Cultural Evolution Society, so I do um, had some funding for this, this great workshop from the Cultural Evolution Society, so I'm really uh, pleased to see numbers of joined audits near the end of the day, but we had a lovely full room earlier, and it was really lovely to see uh, cultural evolution being discussed in Brazil. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the society. I don't think I need to tell you what cultural evolution is after today, um, but I've just taken some things from the website to show you what we're about. Um, so we're a professional scientific society, I'm really keen to advance the theory and practice of cultural evolution. So we see that actually cultural evolution is discussed, perhaps not in the same terms, but across a huge diversity of disciplines. And so we're really keen that uh, now we've got this kind of momentum going to, to draw all those disciplines together um, under the umbrella of cultural evolution and, and hopefully have academic integration um, following from that. And also, if we think about um, public policy, often that is geared towards change within cultures. So cultural evolution um, and the society in particular can really try to um, turn our research to, to the good of society. So um, we're really interested in applied angles for cultural evolution research. Um, just a little bit about the society. Um, our first president was Pete Richardson, who was, the, along with several others in, in um, California, was the first to model uh, cultural evolution um, in the 80s. Um, and now it's me. They're really big shoes to fill, but I'm trying my best. Um, our secretary is Fiona Jordan in Bristol, um, and our treasurer is Alex Masudi in Exeter. Um, so rather UK-based at the moment, but um, and we have a really diverse executive committee. We have a really strong mandate on equality and diversity. So our um, executive committee covers wide geographic representation, and Patricia Izar has just joined the executive committee representing. Um, South America <laughs> as a whole. Um, but we also really want uh, involvement of early career researchers, um, all, all through different ages and disciplines. So I'd encourage you to join if you have any interest in cultural evolution. Everybody's welcome, whether you're studying humans, non-humans, any context. Um, recently, as, as the society was established, so uh, just in 2015, they conducted um, a survey of all the founding members, some 600, and 236 replied to a survey. And so they were able, the society before I became president, identified the grand challenges for the study of cultural evolution. Um, and this is what they came up with, a big network of all the important topics that people mentioned in this survey, um, and all the interconnections, despite the fact that there are several different topics and the color coding shows you that four key themes, they're all so interconnected that it really shows it's a coherent field. It's not just um, ad hoc, different disciplines speaking about similar things, but not interacting. Um, and there's strong evidence for um, an appetite for applied research. So the, the, the little blue cluster at the top here is about education and um, really trying to um, get the message of cultural evolution outside of universities and beyond the ivory towers. Um, we are very interested in um, applications of cultural evolution, so we have one working group established at the moment um, looking at evolutionary approaches to sustainability. Um, they are looking for more members, so if you're interested in the environment and applying cultural evolutionary approaches to how we can um, 
save our environment, then, then you can join that working group. And we're also looking to establish more, perhaps in health or education, public policy, economics, anything uh, that people think that they can apply cultural evolution research to, uh, to societal issues. And I'm currently working on um, getting more grant funding to provide small grant opportunities uh, for um, individuals who are working, um, who are early career or working on um, novel ideas or bringing in different disciplines who've not traditionally interacted with cultural evolution or from different geographical regions, because we are very biased by North America, uh, Northern Europe, and we don't want to be. So um, we're working on that. Um, as I said, this uh, workshop was funded by, partly funded by the workshop fund. Um, and so if any of you have any ideas and you want to um, run any other workshops, there are two deadlines per year. You can get $1,000. I know it's not a lot. I had put 10,000 by accident and hastily had to change it this morning, um, but it, it, it helps. So um, particularly uh, early career individuals, if you have some ideas, you have lots of ideas, perhaps you want to run a workshop, um, then uh, please do apply. Um, and I just wanted to mention our sequence of uh, conferences. So this beautiful poster was created in, in Jena for, and it's now become our Cultural Society logo and you can get t-shirts. This is me wearing the t-shirt. That's the best evidence I could find of the t-shirt. I forgot to bring it. Um, we had uh, our second meeting in Arizona last year um, where there was a bit of a tweet fest going on um, and Kate Cross, who some of you may know from, from her tweets, she uh, made hundreds of haiku tweets and, and this is the one that I like the best. Well, that was a joy. Thanks to the organizers, see you in two years. So we have our conferences every two years. And the next one, as a few of you have heard, is in Japan. Um, 21st to 23rd of September in 2020. So if this has whetted your appetite for cultural evolution, then uh, please do come along. It's in Hokkaido in the north of Japan. And I was talking to Edu, and, and it might be that my assumption that we'd see these beautiful autumn colors is incorrect, but we can hope. Okay, um, if you have any questions about the society, uh, please feel free to ask me, but otherwise, please join if you're interested. Thank you. The only failure in diversity is that you didn't have my size of the t-shirts. Oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> no, they ran out of most of the t-shirts. We, we hope to have t-shirts in Japan. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for attending this long workshop. And... And now feel free to attack the sandwiches we provided for you and... I think before we go, we should have a round of applause for somebody else. Oh yes. The organizer. So... Uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah, you too. I also have to, to thank the, my scientific committee that helped me, Marco Varela, Yaka Valentova, Marcelo Benvenuti is here, and Natalia Dutra over there. <laughs> and my students, uh, which helped in all the many tasks, including uh, paying the monkeys to show up yesterday uh, and receive our, our guests. Thank you.